Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ecology of Spirit, Biocentrism, Animism, and the Environmental Crisis. My name is Max Wilbert. I am an activist, writer, and I am the organizing director for Deep Green Resistance. For those who aren't already familiar with our work, DGR is a radical environmental movement that is dedicated to defending the planet. And our allegiance is to the land, and we reject false technological solutions. We recognize that industrial civilization is incompatible with life on this planet. So Deep Green Resistance, or DGR, is an analysis, a strategy, and an organization. It's the only organization of its kind, as far as I know. As an analysis, we're looking at how civilization, the culture of empire, is the social structure that is responsible for destroying life on this planet. And by recognizing the roots of this problem, we can create a meaningful strategy to address it. So as a strategy... Deep Green Resistance offers a concrete plan for how to stop the destruction through a two-pronged approach, an above-ground movement, engaging in organizing, resistance, and building alternative cultures, and an underground wing dedicated to strategically dismantling the institutions which are destroying the world, using nonviolent methods, and when necessary, coordinated dismantling or sabotage of industrial infrastructure. So as an organization, Deep Green Resistance is dedicated to implementing the above ground portion of this strategy. And you can learn more about our organization or how to get involved at deepgreenresistance.org. I'm very glad you all were here. I'm laughing a little bit right now because we had some last minute technological problems. So I was uh, fiddling with settings in the few seconds before the stream began as that counter was ticking down. But I think we've got our issues sorted out and we're ready to move forward with the event today. So let me tell you a bit about how this is going to go. We're going to hear from speakers today, including the author Derek Jensen, uh, Micmac Warrior Society member Sockedge Ward, uh, Teokas and Ghost Horse, uh, Lear Keith, and many others. And this event today is also a fundraiser. So Deep Green Resistance is a very small grassroots organization, and we are radicals. We are unabashed radicals. So the perspectives that you're going to hear here today are not welcome in the mainstream environmental movement, and they're not funded or supported by the traditional foundations and big money donors that support that movement. And what that means is that we rely on grassroots support. It's a small group of people like you who support our work, allow us to pay for three part-time organizers, uh, support grassroots land defense campaigns around the world, including some which you're going to hear more about during this event, and do our basic outreach work, public speaking, running our websites, releasing podcasts and video content, holding conferences and gatherings, and providing training to hundreds of grassroots radical activists around the world. So uh, I'm glad you're here once again. If you want to support us, you can donate at givebutter.com slash ecology of spirit. We've got some volunteers who should be in the chat of the Facebook live stream right now who can drop the link to that fundraiser in the chat so that people can donate right now. We're hoping that supporters will sign up for monthly donations even if it's a very modest amount, because that allows us to plan ahead for the future and be proactive with our, uh, our strategic plans and to do so with confidence that our community, this community is behind us, supporting our work, that we're all working together. Not everyone can be on the front lines of these types of movements, these types of fights, but we can all work together to make this a better world. So I'm gonna check in periodically throughout the event today and remind people that the fundraiser is going forward. But for now, I want to move on to our main topic, which is spiritual connection with the land, ecology of spirit. And for that, I want to pass the microphone first to my good friend, Will Falk. Will is an activist, a writer, and an attorney. The natural world speaks, and Will's work is how he listens. He believes the intensifying destruction of the natural world is the most pressing issue confronting us today. And he's the author of two books, How Dams Fall, Stories the Colorado River Told Me, 
and recently a book of poetry called When I Set the Sweet Grass Down. I've been working very closely with Will for many years now. He'll be sharing an update later on about some of that work with Protect Packer Pass. But to start off our event today, he has agreed to share one of his poems with us to help open this event. So, Will, I'm so glad you're here. Can you come on? I don't think I can start my video. <clears throat> Let me fix that for you. All right, try again. There we go. Um, yeah, yeah. My name's Will Falk. Um, thank you very much, Max, for that uh, introduction. I'm really um, honored to be here and, and really honored to be asked to uh, read a poem to start things off. Um, yes. I uh, I love I love the the topic um, for this event ecology as spirit and I I think I saw in the description of the event the spirituality of the front lines um, I really like thinking about that um, I feel like uh, you know as as if you're here you probably understand that um, the natural world is being destroyed it's being destroyed at ever faster paces um, and we're losing so much the longer it takes us to, to stop this culture. Um, so finding our courage to, to resist uh, is something that is really important. And I think spirituality uh, has helped people um, for a long time find, find that courage to resist. Um, I, I, I'm going to read a poem um, uh, from my book, When I Set the Sweetgrass Down. The poem is called When I Set the Sweetgrass Down. It is um, kind of a, a short story about my um, journey to finding a spirituality or making sense of spirituality for myself. Um, as I was thinking about this poem, there's a great uh, Lakota lawyer, uh, theologian, and professor who wrote a lot of amazing books. Uh, his name is Vine Deloria Jr., and anyone trying to understand spirituality in, in the ecological times that we're living through, I highly recommend reading his book, God is Red. Uh, in that book, he says that um, traditional spiritualities, and his book is kind of a critique of Christianity, a native critique of Christianity, he calls it. And he explains that in his view and through all of his studies, uh, all traditional spiritualities are about teaching um, the practitioners of that spirituality how to live uh, in right relationship uh, with the land that that they're on and um, how to um, or, or the, those spiritualities are also an expression of the land that um, those people find themselves on. And he explains that you know, as a Lakota, um, his spiritualities teach him and, and his people how to live on the Great Plains, but it wouldn't make sense to take Lakota teachings to the deserts of the Southwest and try to teach the Hopi or, or the Zuni how, how to um, practice spirituality. And he says that um, one of the reasons why he thinks the world is in, in such a horrible place right now is that religions like Judeo-Christianity that were developed in the deserts of Palestine have been transported all over the world. Um, and taking that spirituality to Turtle Island, to North America, um, doesn't make very much sense since we're so far from the land that, that birthed it. Um, so... Uh, what do we do if, if we're trying to find a spirituality, especially for someone like me, who's a long way from my ancestors? Uh, I'm from I have Irish and German ancestry. Um, you know, Christianity dominated my people's beginning 1500 years ago. Um, I'm not sure we can remember our spiritualities. And even if we could, um, if if Deloria is correct, why would we bring those to Turtle Island when they were born um, a continent away? Um, so for me, when I look at spirituality, I think about, um, what Deloria said, it's about teaching us how to live in right relationship with the land. Well, what is right relationship right now, especially when land, all of our ancestral homelands and, and everywhere that we are is, is being destroyed is under attack in front of us. Now, if I was being killed, if I was being tortured, um, if I was being murdered, 
And someone w- wanted to ask me, how do you live in right relationship with me? You know, I don't really need somebody to pray for me. I don't really need somebody to perform a ceremony for me. I don't really need to, for somebody to tell me how much they love me. At that time, right relationship involves protecting me, stopping my murder. Um, and I think that now spirituality of the front lines involves um, protection, protecting that which creates our spirituality. That's what that which gives us life. Um, and this poem is is about that. Uh, and if I may point out, I think the operative line in this poem is let my labor be my prayer. Let my labor be my prayer. When I set the sweet grass down. Too often these days, I cannot make the sweet grass meet the flame. The fragrance is a borrowed prayer anyway. My ancestors fallen over a continent and an ocean away, forgot how, or maybe never knowing my great grandmothers, I lost them too. And neither Bridget, Christ, the creator, or even a common ghost ever answers. Oh yes, I constantly look to the heavens, but the moon is too far to hear, the stars too beautiful to care, and the sun, Well, he's too busy keeping everyone alive. It's better to look to your friends. So I do, and on the other side of the glass, a mother bear ignores the thorns and shakes blackberries out for her cubs. Her prayers are evident in the blackish blue stains on her cubs' happy faces. I didn't hear her say anything. Just some blood in the fallen leaves where the stickers got into her paws. She looked at me for a moment and nodded to a clearing in the bushes where my granddaughter played with her cubs. With no children nor gods or goddesses of my own, that little girl's hope haunted me. I set the sweet grass down and turned back to my work. Working, wading through my own thorns, My sweat waters plants. My blood feeds the soil. The bile boiling in my stomach is a language the land understands. So let my labor be my prayer. Let my granddaughter see the scars, blackberry bushes ripped into my skin. Let her taste those berries and paint her skin blue with juice instead of grief. That's how the bears pray anyway. Thank you very much. Looking forward to a great event. Thank you, Will. Really appreciate you sharing that with you. Your poetry is always so incredibly moving. Thanks. So the next uh, speaker that I'd like to introduce is uh, Rebecca Wildbear. And uh, Rebecca is the author of a book called Wild Yoga, Practice of Initiation, Veneration, and Advocacy for the Earth. She is the creator of this practice, which empowers people to tune into the mysteries that live within the earth community dreams and their wild nature, so they can live a life of what she calls creative service. She has been leading these programs since 2007 and is also a wilderness guide with the Animus Valley Institute. Rebecca and I have been in dialogue for uh, quite a few years now about the relationship between spirituality and activism, and I asked her to share some words with us to help us begin the event this evening. So Rebecca, please come in and join us. Thank you, Max. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. Uh, yeah, I, I'm very excited by this conversation. It's a, it's a gap I've been trying to, to bridge between the, the spiritual realm and, and, uh, and activism in my own life for some time. Um, I'm gonna, I put together some words to read some some part of it is newly created and part and most of it is excerpted from my book wild yoga um, which brings together some of these ideas my whole life i have felt the divine in nature in the movements and gestures of desert ocean stream dolphin trees the breeze makes music with the leaves Rain offers itself to the grasses, thunderstorms crackle, rivers carry their waters to the sea, the moon moves with the tide, coyotes howl, 
crickets make a concert for the night. Spirit abides in all living things and is inseparable from the natural world. To destroy the earth is to desecrate God. We begin to restore the balance when we honor the sanctity of life. The sacred is within and all around us, connecting earth and mystery. We can experience mystery as a numinous or mystical revelation about our unique essence or as a union with the absolute. Humans are meant to live attuned to spirit, earth, and mystery. As a guide, I bring people into the wilderness and invite them to have a direct relationship with what is holy, to hear the song of the planet, listen to the images arising in their dreams, and discover their soul's unique mythic purpose. The images I receive from my dreams and conversation with the natural world surprise and challenge me, but they've offered me clues about who I am and who I need to be. They give me ways to engage authentically amid the impossible nightmare of ecocide. When we live in deep relationship with nature, listening and communing with the earth, she can guide our actions and our lives personally and collectively. In our dominant culture, spirituality is commonly thought of as separate from action or activism, but contemplation and action, mystery and manifest, listening and acting, prayer and protection are meant to exist in community together. Modern culture has separated us from our land and the instinct to protect it. We reclaim power when we deepen our relationship with the earth and listen and receive for vis the visions for ourselves in the world. Listening gives us visionary power by which we can change the world. Falling in love with nature can give us the courage to care for the world. Listening and relating to those we love and protecting them are both healthy instincts. Ancient and present day cultures of indigenous and nature-based peoples experience the earth as animate. Animism, one of the oldest belief system in the world suggests that soul and spirit exist in humans, animals, plants, and rocks. All of us are the descendants of indigenous people somewhere. Our ancestors saw the cosmos as in soul. It's in our DNA to perceive mountains, rivers, and oceans, to be as alive as thunder, wind, and stars. We can reawaken this inherent capacity and revive animistic perception by spending time in wild places and engaging our wild imaginations. Some say those who ascribe human characteristics to animals and forces of nature anthropomorphize, but this term dismisses the intelligence of trees, elk, and ravens. Unfortunately, most people fail to see that other beings besides humans have an essence and inner life. Instead, the dominant culture teaches us to perceive nature as a lifeless commodity. This misperception is at the foundation of our ecological crisis. We must choose to look at the world as in soul. Then we'll see the intelligence of bears, forests, the ocean, and the sun. We can regard nature as alive, engage in a direct conversation, share our most potent questions, feelings, and longings. Take a moment to close your eyes now and feel the earth's body as an extension of your own. We reside within her. Take the time to learn more about who she is and what she needs. I spoke to trees and rocks when I was, when I was young. I knew they had feelings and lives, but like most children, I was taught this perception was just in my imagination, not real. I spent most of my time outside sitting in the branches of maple or pine trees in my suburban neighborhood. My grandparents' home bordered the New Jersey Pine Barrens and I marveled at how much life a forest could hold. I loved walking in the dark soil of the swamp with giant ferns growing under white cedar trees. Studies show that children spend far less time playing outdoors than previous generations and, more attuned to, and are more attuned to computers and video games than the cycles of nature. Author, author Richard Love coined the phase nature deficit disorder, the idea that humans, especially children, are mentally and emotionally harmed by not spending enough time in the natural world. Modern culture's disconnection from nature isn't new, yet research shows the disconnect is worsening due to fears of nature, too much screen time, and a loss of wild places. Chellis Glendening calls the systematic removal of our lives from the natural world by the dominant paradigm of Western civilization our original trauma. 
For the last few decades, I have guided others to reattune their perception, thinking, feeling, imagination, to listen to the earth. Our wholeness and wellness come from being rooted in the rhythms and cycles of nature. We tend our psyches not by ridding ourselves of pathology, but by replanting ourselves in the earth and asking her to guide us. There are many ways you can do this. You can begin. Go outside and be in nature. Leave technology behind and get out of your head. Slow down, be present. Imagine you are seeing nature for the first time. Notice with all your senses who and what is around you. Notice what ecosystems or beings call you. Spend time taking in these places. Be present with all your senses. Fall in love with a non-human, something as small as a ladybug or as big as a mountain. What is it like to be with what you love? Feel your capacity to love nature grow. Look at the wild world with love eyes. These practices are best in the wild, yet I've known people who've done them in cities. A man in India who fell in love with the lone tree in his city and decided to sit with it after passing it by for a lifetime, put his hands on the trunk and let himself be enchanted by the tree. Listening to nature is like having a wise friend and guide to consult with. This is the most cherished and valuable resource the earth has to give us. <clears throat> At 30 years old, I quit my job, moved out west and went to the ancient canyon in Southern Utah to participate in a ceremony to deeply listen, a three day solo, solo fast. Each day I looked up at the red walls and the stunning canyons below asking aloud, what is my purpose? What am I to do? The desert's response was silence. Sometimes I heard the flap of a raven's wings or the call of a morning dove. On the third and final day, my body was so weak from fasting. Yet I had to hike down to the bottom of the canyon to place a rock on a stone pile and signal I was okay to another cluster. My heart was beating so rapidly it scared me. Would I have a heart attack? On the hike back up, I stopped every few feet to rest. Suddenly I was reminded of when I had cancer and the two lymph nodes in front of my heart when I was 21. I remembered the pressure in my chest and how difficult it felt to breathe. Once I was finally back at the top where the gray rock was, I collapsed, exhausted. And I listened, mesmerized by the pounding of my heart, loud, strong, fast. What's my purpose, I asked again, this, not, not, this time not expecting an answer, to the pinyon and juniper trees covering the canyon. Braveheart, I heard a nearby pinyon whisper. I felt disarmed. No, that's a movie, my response was fast but too late to stop the flood of memories, images, and emotions. Seeing flashes of moments when I was brave made me feel overjoyed. I dared to speak and take risks. Remembering times when I turned away in fear stirred up feelings of regret. I have unsure who Braveheart is, but I want to be her. Listening to the earth can give us the most essential instructions of our lives. Humans are meant to develop our capacity to live in partnership with the earth. This is imperative for the survival of humans, the biosphere, and all life. Our wellness and the wellness of the planet are linked. Speaking and listening to the earth is foundational to a healthy life. Our imagination is key to reestablishing the capacity to listen to nature. Imagination can link us to intuition and an um, imagination can link us to intuition and an innate emotional, emotional affiliation with all living organisms. Activating biophiliac love for the wild and catalyzing a yearning to be close and care for nature. Here are some ways you can re-engage your imagination to partner with the earth. Imagine what it'd be like if you were a tree, a canyon wall, a river, or a bobcat. Sense yourself covered in fur or bark. Perceive the world through the eyes of non-humans. Merge with one in your imagination. Then return to being human. Feel the rise and fall of breath and blood pulsing through your veins. Become aware of the shape of your body. Sense yourself as a cell within the earth's body, a part of her recognizing how you are in communion with the natural world and live within her and are wholly dependent on her. Feel how you are constantly intermingling with and nourished by the earth. Talk and listen to the non-human world. Speak to trees, rain, or rocks with words, song, silence, or movement. Do not expect a response, but leave space for the possibility. A reply may come as a sign, synchronicity, dream image, vision, memory, or emotional sensation. Listen with all your senses, intuition, feeling, and imagination. Notice what arises within you while in a particular place. 
awaken to your visionary or imaginal self so you can receive images from the earth through deep imagination. Ask the earth what she wants you to see. Our deep imagination is a wilderness that allows the animate natural world to speak to us so we can participate in the dreaming of the world. Images, words, sensations, memories, and, and emotions that come from the deep imagination arise unbidden in night dreams or daydreams in the liminal space at the edge of consciousness. And often they do not make sense to the rational mind. We can tell they come from the deep imagination partly because we would not have consciously thought of them. We seek to be guided. We can seek to be guided by the mysteries we receive. Mystery and earth know better than I do who I am and what I'm meant to serve. My journey has been an attempt to listen and understand. Six months after my solo, I did a ceremony to accept the name Braveheart. I did not understand who she was, but I kept listening as I embodied who I imagined her to be. I did and said things differently. I went to places, I went to places and had conversations I sensed she might have. I aimed to be more courageous. Many cultural myths recognize sacred power, helping people understand their place in a divine pattern. At Animus Valley, where I've studied and guided the past two decades, people descend into nature and psyche to understand their mythic souls. Our souls or mythic or mythopoetic identity can be experienced through symbol, dream, myth, archetype, metaphor, poem, or image. Soul is often misunderstood in the dominant culture to mean vocation. At Animus, we define soul as an ecological niche and the unique way we enrich the relational, the enri the relational web. Yet ecosystems are collapsing under the greed of global capitalism and more species and land die each day. Our, pre our prayers need to stretch beyond the individual. Soul making is a collaboration tied to the fate of earth, asking us to descend into the collective dark night of our planet. To love the natural world is to weep at how humanity harms her. If we open to the tremendous sorrow of our failure to protect oceans, forests, and rivers, this can bring us into the world's heart, dismembering our sense of self and what we have believed about the world. We can receive visions for the earth through a collective descent. We can let the earth touch us and let what she is saying through feelings engendered in our heart. By listening to dreams, our muses and nature, we, we align ourselves with powerful allies and can glean our purpose and understand how to serve the whole. The harms humans are causing, the earth asks us to return to her, listen and pray for visions that can help us restore balance. Being in our deep imagination, while attuning to nature's wild imagination can enlarge our perception, align us with a deeper intelligence and remind us of ancient and new potentialities. Grounded in reverence for the living planet, we can listen for what she needs. We can pray for a vision to help us respond to cure cut forests, plowed prairies, drained wetlands, and the harms of human only land use like mining and agriculture. We can dream for ourselves, our communities and the earth. We can ask our dreams how to protect land and species. We can ask our dreams how to stop systems of power from destroying more nature. We can act on what we receive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. Really appreciate you taking the time to share. Um, for those who uh, aren't aware, which may be most people watching this, uh, working with Rebecca was actually a, a major impetus to the beginning of the Thacker Pass campaign, Protect Thacker Pass. And without her, that may never have taken place. And I think there's this mystery in the work that people like Rebecca do, where this work that is taking place quietly inside people's hearts may have ripple effects that are unforeseeable. So thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, for those who are just joining us, I want to uh, remind you that this event is also a fundraiser. And uh, we, if you're watching on Facebook right now, um, please check out the link that is in the comments. It's to givebutter.com slash ecology of spirit. You can also continue watching the live stream on that page. It's accessible as well to people who aren't on Facebook, who don't have a Facebook account. So our team should be sharing that link in the comments and you can go to givebutter.com slash ecology of spirit and donate to support this organization and support the work that we're doing around the world. So our next speaker who I'm very proud and excited to bring in is Lear Keith. Lear is an author, an environmentalist, 
and a food activist. She's based in California and is the co-founder of Deep Green Resistance and the Women's Liberation Front. Lear has authored many both fiction and nonfiction books, including the highly acclaimed Vegetarian Myth. She co-authored the Deep Green Resistance book and co-authored Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It, along with Derek Jensen and myself. And Lier is going to help us today put all of this in context. So Lier, thank you so much for joining us and take it away. Thank you. So can I share screen? Uh oh, you have to enable screen sharing. Yeah, let me do that, right? Do that. I know that now we got to do the technology thing. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> okay, you should be good to go now, Lear. All right. I'm trying to get it to the slideshow. There we go. All right. So right now, scientists are debating whether a quarter, a third, or fully half of all mammals will be extinct by 2050. In fact, some of them are debating whether the planet will be supporting life at all by the end of this century. What's not up for debate, not ever, is a way of life that devours with an entitlement so profound it is turning the planet to dust. The dust is not hyperbole. The dust storms in China, the inevitable endpoint of agriculture, the dust storms are so bad, they are triggering asthma in children in Colorado. So here's the dust leaving China, and here it is landing in Aspen, Colorado. Um, here's the first day of the Dust Bowl in North Dakota. Here's Iraq. No one in their right mind would call this place the Fertile Crescent now. Here's Iran. That's not a mountain in the distance, that's dust. That's literally soil turned to dust. I know it's unbearable. Reality is an avalanche of grief right now, but I'm asking each of you to take your hearts out of cold storage. You put it there for safekeeping, I know, but there is no safety on a planet being murdered. So how did we get here? Well, we're gonna back up 4 million years. And don't worry, I'm gonna go fast. Um, I stole this slide from Dr. Michael Eads and I highly recommend his presentation on human evolution where I got this. But anyway, um, the author Authralopithecus uh, emerges on the plains of Africa. About 2.3 million years ago, the genus Homo arrives, and that's us um, there at the bottom. But there at the top, uh, just FYI, that was the last line of our close ancestors that tried to be vegetarian, and they all died out. So I know exactly how they felt. Anyway, uh, Homo habilis uses stone tools, has the brain the size of a chimpanzee, and over the next million years, so it's a long time in the making, Habilis undergoes a process that's called encephalization. So their cranial capacity doubled and then Homo erectus emerges and they migrate out of Africa about one and a half million years ago. Um, and they're the first to use fire and more complex tools. So they're not just using rocks, they're actually making tools from rocks. Homo sapiens appears 400,000 years ago and by 200,000 years ago, they're identical to modern humans. So we arrive on the scene. By 100,000 years ago, we're burying our dead and we're doing it ritualistically. So the bodies are positioned, they're painted with ochre usually, something red, and they've got grave goods. So things that were important to people are buried with them. Um, this is the oldest human burial found to date and it's in a place called Quefsa, which is in modern day Israel. By 50,000 years ago, we have modern human culture. So people are making clothes from hides, they're making jewelry, musical instruments, there's way more sophisticated hunting techniques um, like trapping pits and nets. There's barter. They're clearly trading things across long distances. And there's art. Well, what are we painting? We're painting a lot of animals. The oldest art made by humans. Uh, this is a 44,000 year old cave painting in Indonesia. Now this image portrays a group of creatures on the left there. They're part human, part animal figures. And that's called a therianthrope when it's part human, part animal. So like the Sagittarius image in astrology that's you know half, half got the human head and then the, the rest of it's an animal body, that's a therianthrope. Um, and there, so some people say, well, this is maybe the first incidence of religion or what became religion because suddenly you, you see that humans have this capacity to imagine something that simply doesn't exist. 
it's not just what they see in the world, what they're painting. They're actually imagining something that's not there. Um, and so the, the, this prehistoric cave art provides some of the most direct insight available into the earliest storytelling, because this is a story what's going on here. Um, before the, oh, sorry, hang on, I gotta put the back outside, come on. Outside you guys, all right. I have five gigantic dogs, so when they go off, it really goes off. Um, so the first thing that people start doing is they're making symbols, they're making paintings and carvings of things, um, but they're static things, okay? There's, there's no, they're not telling a story. They're definitely doing something, um, but we don't know what exactly. So you have dots and lines um, and ladders and little checkerboards and you know, different shapes, um, but we don't know what they mean. They're very intriguing, but we don't actually know how to interpret them. One thing you do find a lot of at this point is vulvas. They're literally everywhere and nobody pretends this is not what this is. They are absolutely doing something with vulva imagery. Um, but again, these are all static. So then all of a sudden there's this, there's this turn and we start telling stories with our art. Um, this is a story, you know, there's a lot going on here. The Therianthropes, um, some of them have bird heads and human bodies. Some of them have quadruped bodies and human heads, but they're expressing something here. Um, and again, we don't really know what, but it seems to me that what's going on here is there's some way that they're trying to express that they're animal and they're human. They're, they're both of these things are going on at once, right? So that's, that's the inner experience of this. Yes, I'm an animal, but I'm this other thing called human as well, but I'm still an animal. Like they're not forgetting that they're animals, even while they're making art, which is this new thing on the planet. Nobody had done it before. Um, so that's the Therianthropes. And then also they're telling the story of this hunt, right? It, this is not just like a symbol. This is actually a drawing of this animal and they're showing themselves bringing it down with um, spears and ropes. So they're telling the story of a hunt here. Um, and one more thing to notice, the, the little human figures are tiny compared to this animal. And this really reminds me of a lot of the Japanese landscape paintings. Um, you can probably picture what I mean, like that there's a giant mountain and then little tiny people in the foreground, or there'll be like a huge ocean wave and then you know, little tiny people on the shore. And that really conveys like how vast the, the earth is compared to human experience. And this is much the same. What, what is gigantic in this picture is, is the animal that they're hunting. Um, and its presence is enormous, right? So both spiritually and psychologically, that's what looms large in this picture. I mean, in real life, this is called an anora. And I mean, they're quadrupeds, they're fairly big, but they're not that big. And they're not even as big as bison. You know, they're more like goats, of, like large goats. Um, so anyway, that's that's the first art. That's the real art that we made was the storytelling. And, it, and it's always about the, the animals and the hunt and something to do with that we felt compelled to express. Pablo Picasso went to Lascaux when it was still open to the public. And his famous comment when he emerged was, we have invented nothing. Meaning that that entire sweep of you know, 20,000 years of Western art, and it was all there. It was already being done in the, in the caves. So this is in Zimbabwe, it's the same thing. You've got the enormous animals and then you know, the people telling the story of a hunt. Um, this one I really like because it's very intriguing to me. You have the hunt for sure. And then in the back, the, the two figures far to the right, um, they're clearly meant to be women. A lot of the, the figures in these drawings are very schematic. You don't know who they're supposed to be. You know, there's no faces. They're not, they're not uh, portraiture in any way. They're clearly symbolic. Um, and in this drawing, they have made the women very obvious. They have breasts. So the two you know, ones all the way over on the right are, are clearly women. And what are they doing? Um, the one on the bottom has rattles. So it's, I would say clearly some kind of religious ritual. And around the world, um, still extant people who are hunter gatherers, it very much a part of the hunt is the ritual of the hunt that you are, you're involved in some kind of very sacred and important activity because it's about life and death and it needs to be important. And I think that until very recently, people felt that they understood the importance of that, that sort of liminal place between life and death. And it often, be, you know, you will hear these stories about the, you know, it's the, 
the, the, the people are calling the animals and saying, little brother, little sister, we are hungry. We are, we are poor humans. We are weak humans. We need you. Can come, one of you come? Um, and then, then they hunt. And I think that that is maybe what's going on in this picture. I mean, we're not ever going to know. This was a long time ago. These people are clearly long gone. But she's rattling, right? Which is a, around the world. It's how you induce a, a you know, a, a trance state in humans is through repetition and through rhythm and through drumming and rattling. So she's rattling, and you'll notice the only there's only one animal running toward the human figure. All the others are running away from the hunt, but there is one that is turned toward her and that is coming toward the hunt. So my guess is that's what's going on here. And they're, they're trying to explain this in the art because it's such a profound experience, um, but we don't know. So, okay. And this is the second most common art project. Um, this is the so-called Venus of Holofels. And now a lot of us object to this kind of Venus uh, trivializing because of course Venus is all about love and beauty in later patriarchal religions. Um, and that's of course what women are always reduced to, but um, you know, we think it's more than that, that there's a religious implication here. Um, and it's a complex theological consciousness, whatever it is. And it really does deserve a little more respect than just you know love and beauty. So this goddess was found in a cave in Southern Germany. She's maybe 40,000 years old. She is in fact the oldest known piece of figurative sculpture ever found. So this may be the first one, <laughs> one of many. Um, she's called carved from a woolly mammoth tusk and it probably took at least a hundred hours to carve. And she's in fact quite small, it fits in the palm of a hand, probably worn as a pendant. You can see that little hole around the neck area. So somebody would have worn her around, around their neck most likely. The oldest known musical instrument was found um, right near her. And that was a flute that was carved from a vulture bone. And then there's the remains of the usual, the animals that people were eating. So cave bear and ibex and woolly mammoths and tarpons and all of that. So the first art we ever made was art of the megafauna and the mega females, because that was who gave us life. And I think this is the beginning of religion. And that sacredness of awe and thanksgiving is built into us, body and brain. And these images, this consciousness, is so primary that it carries from the Paleolithic, which is the Stone Age, through the Neolithic into the present day. So the Neolithic just means Neo is new. So this new way, which was agriculture. So Neolithic is the beginning of, of agriculture. So these are some images now from the Neolithic, what, what came next in Europe. Um, and you can see that, so this is one of the oldest agricultural set settlements was Chattahoyok. The ex excavation there is still ongoing. 95% of the images that are dug up are animals and 5% are women. And that's it. Uh, the same template is from the Paleolithic. You've got this, the megafauna and the mega female. So here she is with these giant cats. There's a cat on one side, not sure about the other side, but it's the megafauna and the mega females. So a little bit later, this is Egypt. Um, this is the goddess Hathor, and again, the, the megafauna and the mega female. And so cultures don't just become patriarchal overnight. And even when they transition, even when that transition is complete, the people still are not going to let go of those biophilic religious images. It's too deep in us. So now we're well into patriarchy. This is Artemis um, in the Mediterranean region, but here she is still with her, her megafauna. Another Artemis, again, uh, the megafauna is still with her. And now uh, she's called Diana when you get to the Roman period. But she's still got her hunting gear and she's still out with the megafauna. She's been pushed aside now from the, she's still in the Pantheon, but she's not at the center of it. But she's still there at the wild edges, is, edges with the wild beasts. And here's your basic nativity scene. So it's this woman front and center, bringing forth life on her own in this dark cave of a stable surrounded by the same magic megafauna. It's still the same animals. And remember in the folk culture of Europe that the animals can talk on Christmas Eve. So this is a very magical scene. And for all that time, you know, for two and a half million years, we were not monsters and destroyers. We were participants. So I think this all goes to the point that as humans, our template is that gynocentric biophilic model and try as patriarchy does, it still can't address that biophilia from our bodies or our brains. So here's another one. You've got the virgin goddess bringing forth life on her own in this dark cave of a stable with the magic beasts. 
Okay, if the whole length of that field is our time on earth, the last half yard represents the time we've been doing agriculture and the last one fifth of an inch would be the industrial revolution. So that last half yard is where the disaster begins. Agriculture, agriculture marks the beginning of slavery, the beginning of militarism, it marks the beginning of global warming um, and mass extinction and oh yeah, patriarchy. So here we are at the end of the world. Um, they aren't going to stop unless we stop them. So this is mountaintop removal for coal. This is a 60 mile long toxic lake in China created through rare earth mining for cell phones and computers and the glorious green new energy that we keep being told is somehow better than the old energy, even though it will destroy the earth in much the same way. This land will not heal in anything but a shield. Duke, 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 go outside, go outside. Here's um, the climate which is being wrecked um, and will soon be beyond repair. And of course, deforestation, which has been going on for the same six, 7,000 years. And so the technosphere is going to end with the necrosphere. Um, and unless we build a resistance movement that can stop them, and we can, I mean, I know we can, we can because we have to. Something in us still knows how to love this planet. And I asked you to take your heart out of cold storage because better a broken heart than no heart at all. And that's because even a broken heart is still made of love. So I'm going to leave you with this biophilic image. When bison are under attack, they pack into a tight circle. Protected at the center are the mothers and the babies. Next are the older calves who are weaned and quite vulnerable. A defensive ring of cows without young comes next, protecting them. And finally, facing out, stand the bulls. We are under attack. Every last creature is under threat. He has leveled mountains. Believe him when he tells you who he is. But if we all make that tight circle, mothers and babies of every species at the center, protected until the last, and plant our feet firmly on our still living earth, we can face him down. He has the rancid thrills of sadism and the sterile dreams of machines. We have love and the miracle of our animal bodies and the stalwart light of every dawn. Don't let him win. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lear for all your work. I always need to take a deep breath and uh, be present when Lear finish, finishes speaking. She makes a chill run down my spine as I'm sure she does for many of you watching as well. So for those of you who are just tuning in, this is Ecology of Spirit. We are about 45 minutes into our event today, and we have a couple more hours to go. We've heard from Lear Keith and Rebecca Wildbear. We've heard a poem from Will Falk. And up next, we're going to hear some report backs from a variety of activists, both formerly part of Deep Green Resistance and our friends and allies around the world who are doing all kinds of different land defense campaigns. We're going to hear from Sock Edge Ward later on uh, this afternoon or evening. Uh, Kayla Kelly, uh, Derek Jensen, Alan Clements, Teokas and Ghost Horse. And so we've got a ways to go. I want to remind everyone that this event is also a fundraiser. We are raising money to support our grassroots community organizing, resistance work, defending the planet. You know, we don't get the type of big foundation funding that a lot of environmental groups get because we are radicals. We are uncompromising. And so we rely on support from everyday people. So uh, I've seen the donations have been coming in. Um, our, our, our progress bar is ticking up. So that's really good to see. The link to donate is in the chat. If you're watching this on Facebook, uh, it's givebutter.com slash ecology of spirit. People can donate there. You can also sign up for monthly donations. And that's a great way to support our work because it allows us to plan ahead for the future. One of our main goals for this event is to sign up 
uh, hopefully as many as 50 new monthly donors to the organization. Even if it's a small amount of money, um, that regular steady uh, donation coming in every month makes a huge difference to us and our ability to do this. So uh, with that said, I want to transition. Oh, one more thing about the donations. There is also a auction as part of the don donations. So on that Give Butter website, there's a tab or a button there that says auction. And if you click on that, you should see some items that are available for bidding um, that have been donated by DGR organizers and supporters around the world. So if folks are interested in that, check out the auction as well. But now we're going to transition and we're going to get started with a few pre-recorded video check-ins because we have folks in all parts of the world and time zones do not always allow them to easily be here on, uh, on a live call. So I am going to pull up the pre-recorded video from some of our folks around the world and play that. And then we're going to hear from a couple folks uh, on live video as well who are in uh, easier time zones from which they can join us. So let's get started with this video. Hi everyone, I am Amal from DGR France and I'm here to present a short video about what we have been doing at DGR France and uh, what is uh, forward to us. Last year we started uh, the activism year with a, a eco feminist conference in Lyon and we had the opportunity to talk about DGR strategy applied to eco feminism and also we were involved um, in uh, campaigning against mining in central France here in France they are talking about opening a lot of mines for lithium and other um, minerals and uh, this year we have uh, we are launching a DGR tour so we are going all over France basically and our aim is to organize events presenting DGR and uh, deep ecology and our strategy um, so we are launching our first event uh, in two weeks on the 3rd and 4th of November in Normandy and we are very thrilled about that. It's going to be every month a new uh, place, a new location and a new uh, DGR presentation with new people. So yeah, thank you for the opportunity to talk and please donate to DGR. It's very important. Thank you. Bye. Hello everyone. My name is Jeff from Archipelago or Soho, Philippines. I am part of Deep Green Resistance and uh, DGR Asia Pacific is currently uh, focusing and working with different uh, local formations and networks who's fighting back against the uh, seabed quarrying and reclamation projects here in uh, in archipelago. On our data, there are 187 reclamation projects application around the country and out of it uh, there are 23 in Manila Bay and out of 23 there are six or seven who's been uh, oper operational for the past uh, for the past month. So um, reclamation projects uh, require a destructive activities such as dredging or seabed quarrying and because of these activities uh, it destroy the fishing ground of our municipal fisher folk, they destroy the livelihood of the coastal communities and it directly uh, destroyed uh, the marine uh, ecosystem that has a big threat when it comes to uh, food security, the climate, and to life in general. Because we know that ocean has a big, very uh, big participation uh, in our uh, ecosystem. So <clears throat> uh, a developing country like us is, we're, we're always victim of this kind of development. But uh, on our perspective, uh, this is uh, not the type of development that, that we need. And we know that this type of development are not uh, sustainable and will never uh, support life in this planet. So um, we hope that you will support our campaign here in Archipelago and we hope that uh, you will continue supporting our organization. Thank you so much and uh, love and solidarity. 
land is very precious to us and it is our our land is sacred to us so we need to protect it remember that uh, our country was controlled for 333 years by the colonial uh, Spaniards and then followed by the Americans and then again it was controlled by Japanese for about four, four years and then they come back again even though we have the what we call the independence through their big corporations we had the Dole that uh, produces and controls the bus track plant of Mindanao that produces banana for exports and we have uh, the, the tobacco and then the sugar canes uh, and the other one that uh, that ruins our land are the big corporations the mining corporations that are here in the Philippines some of them are corporate by Japanese with Canadian Americans the Dutch and some of them are Chinese remember that our land is very precious to us as Filipinos remember that our land are very se are separated to each other and then when they ruin it through the mining what will remain to us to live as Filipinos uh, our land is precious to us and we need to stop it and we, we need our help we need to help each other to let this uh, big capitalist stop in destroying our land our land is sacred and it is the only land that we can live our land hosts a different kinds of uh, creatures that is a in some biases with our life we need them so badly and we need to protect them save the whales was a battle cry of one of the most successful fights of the environmental movement. Brave warriors put their body in harm's way to literally save the whales. Their actions led to the banning of the commercial whaling industry. That battle cry is being heard again today as unprecedented numbers of whales are washing up dead on the beaches of the east coast of Turtle Island. This corresponds to energy companies solar mapping to pile drive thousands of monopole turbines into the migration home of the whales. These are the same companies that knew 50 years ago that fossil fuels would destroy the planet and they continually lied about it to make billions in profits. And they're lying now because they say that wind turbines are clean and green and renewable and that we must destroy the whales habitat to save the whales the real question is why aren't these eco terrorists in jail offshore wind was stopped once before off the eastern seaboard and it can be stopped again if you'd like to help save the whales again go to green-oceans.org our victories are temporary. Their victories are permanent. The fight goes on. I'm the co-founder of Rome Free Nation. We're a Montana-based <clears throat> organization that serves the last wild buffalo of Yellowstone country, the last continuously wild buffalo in, in the whole country. Um, we also, Wild Buffalo are our most high priority. We do offer um, our assistance to our allies who are working to protect wild nature, you know, such as, you know, we try to help Acker Pass out. We try to help Prairie Protection Colorado with various projects. Um, but our main focus is definitely working to help the last wild buffalo who are continuously in, in the cross lines, crosshairs. Um, the state of Montana is a livestock industry state and they don't want to share the land with wild buffalo they view them as direct competitors for the grass that they want their cows to have and so they come up with all kinds of excuses and reasons to kill the buffalo whenever they migrate out of yellowstone into montana and it's gotten to the point where 
the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is now considering Endangered Species Act protection for them. And um, our organization is unique in that we are the only ones who actually consider the buffalo's perspective. We're not interested in human perspectives on this. We want what's best for the buffalo from the way how we have been in the field with them. We see what they want. We see what they need. We see where they need to go. We see the obstacles that they face. Um, so that's how we represent is, is from their perspective as best as we can. And, you know, we're trying, we'll be getting back into the field here. The winter's coming, the snow's gonna come. Hopefully it won't be like last year. We lost so many buffalo last year, over 25% of the herd through hunting, so-called hunting, it's not hunting at all. Um, capture for slaughter and um, capture for quarantine, which is a domestication process. So we're trying to work for the buffalo to be able to walk the earth just as she intended for them to do. Um, and we'd love for you guys to join us. And you can find us at roamfreenation.org. We're also on Facebook. We're also on Instagram. And, you know, if you have any ideas or if you have anything, you can lend our way. We need support. We need support to do what we do, going to meetings, being in the field, doing various things. That's my puppy dog, Bran, in the background. I don't know if we can hear him. But, um, and we also, I really want to thank, uh, there's going to be a lot of people watching this, um, Deanna and Beth and Derek and um, lots of people have been super supportive and been helping us out a lot. And we really, really appreciate that. Um, and you as well, Max, I mean, you guys have been so great and supportive and, you know, we're brand new, but we're trying our best. We're roamfreenation.org and we and the Buffalo need your support. So we've heard from activists around the world. And uh, next, I want to bring on James. James, are you with us? James, are you there? Here we go. The control to turn on my video. Can you? Oh, you got it for me. Yep. There we go. Thank you, thank you brother. Uh, I just want to thank everyone first who, who's gone before me in this presentation with uh, a special acknowledgement to you, Max, and the team for, for pulling this all together. Um, and I also want to extend an apology to our brothers and sisters around the globe who are negatively impacted by the US of A's foreign policy and economic priorities. So uh, that is not lost on you, uh, on me and others here. And I just, I want people to, to know that and feel that. Uh, Max, I've got a, a, a slide that I sent you, which is really just to make a, a big, bold statement right up front, Vermont, for those that are in the United States or perhaps North America, South America, and are familiar with how states are broken up, we, we have quite a bit of influence because of our politicians' uh, political clout. And we, we have an undeserved reputation for being environmental stewards. And I can elaborate on that in great detail at some other time. Max, if you wanna go back to the video, that'd be fantastic. So I, if you have not read this book, I wholeheartedly encourage you to do so. You, then you'll understand the reference in the slide that I put up. But this book right here, um, after I had the opportunity to read it, I knew I was not alone and I needed to get involved in DGR. So the point of my update, if you will, today is in answering Sister Lierre's call to circle the bison. Uh, we're doing just that here in New England. This is uh, a call to everyone listening or who may listen to the recording to please join with us. Uh, we're looking for people to engage with us, join us uh, in the other New England states. We already have a pretty solid foundation here in Vermont of 
DGR kindred spirits, but we can certainly use more. We're planning a forum uh, next winter, early spring. We don't have exact dates yet uh, involving Lier and Derek and Max and a number of other people called Respecting uh, Nature, uh, res Restoration After the Flood. So for those who are familiar with all of the damage that our industrial society is doing, you'll know that flooding uh, has been one of the major issues um, impacting particularly the Northeast as far as the states go. So again, um, please do what you can, time, talent, treasure to support the cause. There is no organization without everyone here that's listening. I encourage you to, to do whatever you can, whenever you can uh, for those 200 species each day that are going extinct. I think most of us here on this call would acknowledge that uh, they're not just going extinct. Our, our society is exterminating them and we are the only voice that they have. So thank you and appreciate you. Thanks very much, James. Appreciate you joining us and sharing that. And I hope folks, if they're in Vermont or in the broader region, that they will reach out to us, reach out to James and try and get involved in some of the work that he's been doing as a longtime environmentalist who's relatively new to DGR, but is taking up the torch in that region and, and moving forward. Yeah, if you could, if you could, uh, Max, just maybe post the uh, flyer to the, the chat so that people have Susanna Jones, my co-chair here in Vermont, and uh, my contact information. That would be fantastic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, James, and uh, appreciate you. you joining us. Next up, we're going to hear from uh, another great friend of mine, Deanna Meyer. Deanna mm -hmm. is uh, joining us from Colorado, and she has been a longtime defender of prairie dogs, prairies, mountains, wildlife throughout the state of Colorado, where she found an organization called Prairie Protection Colorado. Deanna, are you with us? Yes. Hi. How are you? Good. Glad you're here. Yes, thank you for having me on. Um, I just want to give a little update of what we're doing here in Colorado and to say too, there's no way that anything that I have accomplished could have ever been accomplished without Deep Green Resistance and the support that I have from this organization, not only in how to strategize to save what I love, but in how to talk about it, how to get the word out and how to organize and get people involved in what I'm doing. So your donations for Deep Green Resistance go a very long way. Uh, here in Colorado, we are working on a few different things. Um, I run an organization called Prairie Protection Colorado. We've saved uh, thousands of prairie dogs again this year. We're moving them. It's really sad we're not able to save the land. But in these efforts, we try to educate advocates that they need to be more radical um, and that the system doesn't work to protect animals. Um, we've been having a lot of support from people in politics in the last couple of years. So we are, a, we have had a radical shift actually in the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission, where now we have five out of 11 people who are, uh, animal activists who are willing to change some of the re regulations. So it's kind of nice to see a little bit of change on the political end. It's never enough. Um, but as our, our main goal here and what a lot of us do is try to save who we can as the system collapses and hope that some of them will be left when, and, and also in hopes that it will end sooner than later for our non-human relatives so that they can continue to exist. And another thing we've been working on, which I'm really excited about is, um, a ballot measure to end the trophy hunting of Colorado's wildcats. And if you're interested in getting involved, this will be on the 2024 ballot, and we are fairly confident it will pass, which is going to save thousands of bobcats and hundreds of mountain lions every year. Uh, hounders kill about 500 mountain lions a year in Colorado, and trappers and hounders as well kill about 1,500 bobcats and sell their fur on the Asian market. So to see that go away in Colorado and then hopefully have it spread to other states would be an amazing uh, effort and, and would have good effects and protective measures for these amazing animals as we fight the deeper systemic problems. And I just, if I can, uh, Max, I'd like to just share my screen with uh, 
with everyone. Um, I'm not seeing the picture on here though, so maybe I'm not able to do that. Itch, you should be able to share now. Let's see. Let's see, well, it's not going to the picture that I want, so that's okay. I'll just tell the story. If it pops up here, I'll, I'll share it, but I'm not, I'm not having the availability to share the picture. Um, it's not letting me share the picture, but this, this last week, which is exciting for me, I practiced listening to the land, um, and trying to, uh, let's see if it'll do, no, it won't. Okay. I'll just stop trying to share that. Um, and, and to like really fight for those that I love. And I've been living here in the same place in Colorado for the past 17 years. And this is the first time I was able, there we go. This is the first time I was able to see a mountain lion. And that happened on Monday. And this beautiful mountain lion that you see on the screen right now, just stared at me and let me gawk at him or her for quite some time, about five minutes. I didn't want to say too long in his or her territory. And to me, I definitely see that as a sign of, of the land telling me we're doing the right thing. And also as the, the, the being who is giving it with other ones that live here, but the one who actually let me see and experience him or her for a long time as a sign that what we're doing is good and that we need to continue to try to save all that we can as we can and and who we can and and the signs come this has happened before when i fought for bobcats too i saw my first bobcat when i was doing that but anyway um i thank you all for everything if you want to get involved and are in colorado or get involved even away from colorado in our campaign to get this on the ballot measure to end the trophy hunting of colorado's wildcats you can go to cats.org and also um help support deep green resistance because without them and without the support that I've had from this awesome organization, I would never have sold, saved a single land or single forest, which we have saved thousands of acres of forest. I would never have saved a single prairie dog and I would not be on this path to help save Colorado's mountain lions. So thank you very much, Max, for having me. And thank you everyone for believing and understanding the situation that we are in. Thank you so much, Deanna. Your work is so inspiring. So next, I want to bring back in Will Falk, who's going to share with us a little bit about Protect Backer Pass, where the campaign stands, and where we're going from here. Will? Yeah. Um, in in 2021, um, uh, Max and I uh, co-founded an organization called Protect Backer Pass, uh, to oppose uh, a massive lithium mine in, in northern Nevada um, that uh, will destroy a number of, of um, uh, species, very critical habitat, including uh, greater sage grouse, um, which is an iconic species in, in the American West, uh, beautiful birds um, whose uh, populations have collapsed 98% since Europeans first came to the area. Um, it's, it's great habitat for, uh, sage brush, the, the plant, um, antelope, golden eagles, uh, some, some rare, um, species of trout, Lahontan cutthroat trout. And it also, this, this massive lithium mine would, um, destroy uh, a number of sacred sites, um, to Paiute and Shoshone peoples, um, including, uh, uh the site of a, a brutal 1865 massacre where, uh, at least 31 Paiute men, women, and children were um, murdered by the U.S. cavalry. Um, those those people were resisting mining encroachments on their land. Um, so uh, to see the um, horrible irony in um, this so-called green energy coming in and uh, destroying um, the memory of 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 the massacres that that were necessary for the first round of mining in Nevada. Um, uh, so yeah, we started that in early 2021, January of next year, uh, we'll begin our fourth year of the campaign. We're in, we're in the third year. Um, the, we have failed to stop that mine. Um, we tried to use a blend of direct action, uh, and legal tactics, um, and, uh, we're not able to generate enough direct action, um, kind of energy to, um, blockade the mine. 
um, and the the lawsuits have have failed. So that mine is going full speed ahead. Um, but uh, Max it, it keeps coming on and, and talking about how important fundraising is. Um, and and I thought maybe I could like share a little bit with you about how expensive the Thacker Pass campaign has been. Um, and especially, you know, for grassroots uh, organizers like Max and I, how personally expensive it's been. Um, you know, Max has said that uh, DGR is an organization that's unapologetically radical. Uh, we talk about things like serious resistance, um, and we are willing to oppose things that the rest of the environmental movement um, is not willing to oppose, like lithium mines. And um, when you, I think when you commit to um, doing that kind of work full time, um, um, like a number of us have, I think you're in many ways, um, by the government's definition of poverty, you're committing yourself to a life of poverty. Um, and it's not just that, but if you, if you make that commitment and do that work, um, and you do it in a way that interferes with corporations and others destroying the planet, um, they will punish you financially. So, um, beginning in 2021, Max and I, uh, uh set up a, a, an occupation of the mine site, um, to raise awareness. Um, we were asked by, um, you know, a number of people in the area. There's no, Thacker Pass is very remote. Uh, the closest restroom is 20 miles away and Paiute elders, uh, would come to pray at the site and needed, um, a place to go to the bathroom. Um, so we built uh, these six foot deep pit outhouses um, where they're going to put the uh, 1400 acre, 400 feet deep open pit lithium mine. And uh, the government agency that um, that manages the land, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, fined Max and I personally uh, just shy of $50,000 for these um, pit outhouses that we built where a, an open pit mine is going. Um, the lesson I always say is that, uh, as we know in the United States, um, if you're a corporation, you're allowed to shit all over the land. Um, if you're uh, just a regular old human being, uh, you're not allowed to shit on the land. Um, we uh, we did uh, organize some, um, we're, we're involved in some protests um, earlier this year, um, trying to, to block construction. And uh, we've been sued, Max and I personally, and, and five others, um, including Protect Thacker Pass as an organization. We've been sued by the corporation for uh, interfering with their mining operations, um, and they're seeking um, as much money as they can get from us, lost profits or lost wages that they couldn't pay contractors while we were um, interfering with their mining operations. Um, so, you know, that could... We, we don't know uh, if we're going to win or lose that case right now. We don't know how much that's going to cost us. It's conceivable that's going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, we've also been involved in, um, um, you know, I'm a lawyer. Um, we have some other great kind of radical lawyers working with us. Um, and we've, we've filed some lawsuits on behalf of uh, local tribes who are opposed to the, to the project. Um, and we we don't charge the tribes uh, for that for that work for that labor. Um, you know we've been in litigation for almost three years now. Uh, hundreds of hours of of a legal you know legal work has gone into it. Um, and to kind of put this into perspective about um, how much that would normally cost, um, we have to work with a local Nevada lawyer in the lawsuit where the corporation has sued um, Max and I and Protect Thacker Pass and a few others. That local uh, lawyer is charging us $350 an hour. Um, she's not doing uh, the bulk of the work. That's kind of how local counsel works. Um, but um, just think about that. If, if you know, I've, I've averaged 70 or 80 um, hours a month on on the litigation for Thacker Pass. Um, and if I was charging $350 an hour, which is kind of run of the mill legal fees, um, just think about how much money that that would be for, for a campaign like this. Um, and then, you know, with Max and I owing 50 grand um, and, and possibly more if we lose the lawsuit that the corporation filed against us, 
um, that's a lot of money. You know, we're, we're, we're getting into the high hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and so I just want to drive that point home about why fundraising and money is so important for grassroots campaigns and especially for the kind of radical kinds of campaigns and the biocentric campaigns. Um, we can't go to very many funders that have a lot of money and say, you know, look at the work we're doing. Um, you know, we're trying to stop industrial civilization and have them uh, write us a check. Uh, it's, it's just really not, you know, we've tried. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, is just, it, it doesn't happen for, for radical grassroots organizations. So sorry to belabor that point. Um, we're still fighting the Thacker Pass mine. Um, uh, there's going to be chances for us to oppose expansions of that mine. There's a lot of mines um, going to go in in northern Nevada and southern Oregon for electric car batteries, and we plan on opposing those for as long as we can. Um, so uh, thank you all very much for your very generous donations, and thanks for letting me report on that, Max. <laughs> thanks, Will. Appreciate that. Uh, on the on the note of checks, before I forget, if uh, folks are interested in donating via check, you can do so. Just go to deepgreenresistance.org slash donate, and there's a mailing address there. So uh, for those who have perhaps joined us uh, in the last little while here, you are watching Ecology of Spirit. This is a Deep Green Resistance event and fundraiser. We're discussing topics around spirituality, animism, biocentrism, ecology, um, and the collapse of the, the, the living systems of our planet, the mass extinction event that we are living under, and the need to organize and resist to try and halt that, to protect the world for the sake of the beautiful life that exists on this planet and for human generations, for future generations. Uh, I'm not a father myself, but I have young nephews, and I am incredibly scared for the world that they not only are going to inherit in the future, but are but are living in right now. Um, I often say that collapse is not a future scenario. It's something that's playing out right now as 200 species are being driven extinct every single day, as chemical pollution is soaring, as greenhouse gases are reaching their highest level ever, as this crisis just seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. We are truly in a, 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 a very dangerous and terrifying situation. And we need to take action. We must take action. There's a moral imperative. So that's what Deep Green Resistance is about. It's about that moral imperative, that drive, that necessity of action. And I want to share a quote on that topic from Andrea Dworkin, the great feminist activist who wrote, when I talk about resistance, I'm talking about an organized political resistance. I'm not just talking about something that comes and something that goes. I'm not talking about a feeling. I'm not talking about having in your heart the way things should be and going through a regular day having good, decent, wonderful ideas in your heart. I'm talking about when you put your body and your mind on the line and you commit yourself to years of struggle in order to change the society in which you live. A political resistance goes on day and night, undercover and overground, where people can see it and where people can't. It is passed from generation to generation. It is taught. It is encouraged. It is celebrated. It is smart. It is savvy. It is committed. And someday it will win. That's Andrea Dworkin. So I want to thank all of you who have been donating one more time. Uh, our next speaker is running a few minutes late, so I want to share a little bit more information and context about the activists who we just heard from, specifically the folks who sent in some videos. We heard from uh, Amal in DGR France, where they have been organizing very effectively for many years, doing outreach or community organizing and campaigns. Um, DGR France just amazes me every time that I speak with them. They are working so hard um, and in a context that is very challenging politically. Many radical ecology movements in France were recently criminalized by the state and forcibly disbanded their, disbanded, their assets seized 
So DGR France is, is facing a situation of serious state repression. Um, we also heard from, speaking of state repression, two of our friends and allies in the Philippine archipelago. Um, these organizers have been working for many years to defend the land there. And as Ja mentioned, the Philippines is facing this mass influx of reclamation projects. So as an island nation, the Philippines has, uh, has a shortage of land for housing developments, ports, industrial facilities, uh, uh, malls, and so on. So these are the government is attempting to address this by uh, reclamation projects, essentially creating land out of bays by dumping uh, soil and crushed concrete and other materials into these bays to build up land until they create new areas of land uh, on which they can build. Um, this is, of course, absolutely devastating to marine ecology in these regions. And the Philippines is an incredibly biodiverse place, or at least it should be. In the areas which haven't been impacted, it remains that way with coral reefs, incredible diversity of fish, shark species, um, a huge range of life inhabiting the oceans. And that is under threat with this ocean quarrying. We're seeing that uh, that threat across the world as deep sea mining is becoming more and more of a threat. That's something that we've covered pretty extensively here at Deep Green Resistance, and some of our organizers are involved in fighting deep sea mining, including one who we heard from in that video, Carl, who spoke about offshore wind, who is fighting the offshore wind energy projects off the coast of uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts, where thousands of wind turbines are being proposed in critical habitat for the endangered North Atlantic right whale, uh, one of the most important fisheries and breeding grounds for fish on the entire coast of New England, is under imminent threat from massive industrial energy development. If this same destruction was happening because of fossil fuels, the environmental movement would be up in arms right now. But because it is supposedly green energy, there has been essentially almost no opposition from the mainstream environmental movement, which has actually supported these industrial scale energy projects, destroying wild habitat in the oceans. Now here on the West Coast, I live in the state of Oregon, and offshore wind turbines are coming to Northern California, the Oregon coast, and the coast of Washington state. We are just starting to bring together organizers throughout this region to try to fight this. Uh, we also have DGR people involved in fighting industrial wind off the coast of Australia. And so this is becoming a new front in the battle for the planet is this, uh, this so-called green industrialism. And I'm so glad that Carl and, and people like him are fighting this. We need more people fighting this, and we're going to need support from our community to make sure it goes forward. Um, finally, I want to mention, of course, Stephanie, who spoke about the buffalo. Uh, Stephanie has been a warrior for the buffalo for many, many years. I had the privilege of spending time with her uh, several times around Yellowstone National Park, going out in the field on cross-country skis, and, and uh, gathering information and standing with the buffalo to spread the word about what they're doing and organizing to protect them. Um, the National Park Service is engaged in deliberate campaigns to keep the population of buffalo from expanding in that region. The buffalo are trying to come back. They want the plains back. They want this continent back. And they are being prevented from healing by the National Park Service, by the Montana Department of Livestock, by uh, corporate forces such as ranching industry forces in the region and other issues. So uh, that's an incredibly important fight as well. And I just want to point out as well, for people who are donating on the Give Butter page right now, you'll see uh, there's something there that says team members and you'll see my face. It says Max. You'll also see DGR Asia Pacific and then Rome Free. And if you click on one of those names, DGR Asia Pacific or Rome Free Nation, you can earmark your donation to go to those organizations or those wings. Um, Rome Free Nation is not officially part of DGR. We're just friends and allies. DGR Asia Pacific is obviously part of our organization, 
But if you click that that name, you can earmark your donation to go specifically to them. We'll send the funds to those folks. So uh, I hope people will do that directly and support the work that we're doing. Um, many of the folks who've joined us so far um, during this event, I, I asked them if they wanted to uh, put their name, put their organization here so that people could send their donations directly to them and folks um, said that they didn't want to do that. So hopefully people will find the websites of these organizations and go to support them directly. So I believe we just had Sockedge join us. So Sockedge Ward is going to be our next speaker. And uh, I would like to introduce him if that's, is that you Sockedge? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. I'm glad you're with us. So let me introduce Sockedge Ward. Sockedge belongs to the Wolf Clan. He is Mi'kmaq, or Mi'kmaq, as some people mispronounce it, I believe, uh, from the community of... <laughs> Let's see if I can get this right. Give it a try. You you told me how to say it right a couple years ago. Eskinobadich. Oh, that's really close. Good job. <laughs> Uh, you're being polite. Uh, the Burnt Church First Nation is uh, what it's known as in English in New Brunswick. Sock Edge served in both the Canadian and United States militaries before realizing he was essentially part, part of a colonial force and turning around and serving in the warrior societies of his First Nation. Uh, he has a long history of advocating and protecting First Nations' inherent responsibilities and freedoms having spent the last 20 plus years fighting the government and industry. And that has led him to speak at the United Nations Working Group for Indigenous Populations. And he has received the National Aboriginal Achievement Award. Uh, Sock Edge is somebody who I've learned a lot from over the years and who we are very blessed and honored to have with us today. Um, so Sock Edge, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And I'd love to turn it over to you. Great. Right. Well, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Um, I think the first thing I bring up is I was having all kinds of technical problems with my laptop. So I am on my phone. So uh, forgive me if this looks shaky because I'm just holding it right in front of me now. Um, no clue what happened to the Zoom link on the, the, the email, but something definitely went wrong. Um, let me start with, uh, obviously, an introduction. So my name is Sogage. I'm Mima from a community called Eskinobadich. So you're pretty close. Uh, my territory is Mimagi. That's the land of, uh, of Mi'kmaq people. Um, I am Wolf Clan by adoption. So that's the Ishinaabe people through the Gichita Warrior Society. Uh, I have five kids and I have four grandkids. And I think to put this in context, since I'll talk a little bit about protection later, um, I'm what uh, my people refer to as smogness. And that means warrior in our language. And, and really, we got to say traditional warrior probably fits best because we could get that mixed up with soldier and things like that. And that's definitely not what I am anymore. When I was young, assimilated, colonized, and had totally brainwashed in the system, I was the poster child for the assimilated native soldier. Um, having gone through my own personal decolonization journey, I feel like 180 degrees completely different. And I've taken a lot of those... Uh, skills and pass them on to warrior societies. And that's pretty much been my calling is working within warrior societies. Um, so Max asked me to speak on natural law and that gives me about 15 minutes to sum up millions of years of history. So I'm gonna do my best. Um, but let me toss out a couple of disclaimers. For those that aren't very familiar with uh, indigenous histories, cultures, worldviews, I think in particular, probably best. I wanna make sure that people understand I am no, in no way promoting, pursuing the idea of pan-Indianism. I'm gonna speak about multiple indigenous nations and a, a lot of our similarities around our belief systems, but I am not promoting this idea of pan-Indianism, where this, this, this concept that all indigenous people are the same and, and we are we are our cultures are as distinct as the cultures you'll find in europe uh, i i think if i had spoke to an englishman and said that oh so your culture is exactly the same as somebody from 
I don't know, uh, Italy or, or Spain, they'd be quick to point out, no, that there's distinctions in their cultures. It's the same with us. So as a Mi'kmaq person, um, I, I, I can't tell you or I can't say that say the new channels of the West Coast have the exact same belief systems or their nation's exact same. That would be incorrect and be a disservice to each and this nation to pursue that kind of line of thinking, right? So I am going to speak about multiple nations, but not in such a way where I'm kind of glossing over and saying everybody's the same, all right? Um, and I am not going to specifically give teachings, indigenous stories and teachings. I'll speak around them, I'll speak about them, but I'm not going to give them because there are way too many culture vultures out there that repackages, commodify the knowledge and try to use it to misrepresent it and use it to make money from it. So I'm not doing that. Um, but I am going to try to talk about this. So let me get into it. There's a lot to say in such a short time. And I'll, I'll try to stay within my, my, my period there, window of, of speaking. Um, so natural order or natural law, and where does it all come from? I think the first thing I got to speak about is this idea that many Indian nations have origin stories or creation stories and again not all but most will speak of a time in the creation stories where things were not right is the word i heard a lot uh not right unbalanced i would say the word chaotic but a lot of times we associate the word chaotic with something kind of almost evil right disordered equal equals evil and that's not correct it just wasn't right for the humans. The world wasn't in a place where it could be extremely nurturing for early humans to, 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 to exist in, right? So this had to change. And then that's where we go from these creation stories into transformation stories. And most of the time, it, it's part and parcel. The creation story is the transformation story. Um, but this idea that a transformation had to take place in our world for humans to be able to live in. And that came about in many different ways. So in my territory with my people, uh, we have a cultural hero, or you could say the word spiritual hero is more correct because he was a spiritual being called Glooskap. And Glooskap went about transforming the world to make it right for humans. With Dishnabe, and I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to impose my ideas on thoughts, but I think if I'm correct, it's Nanabuzu was the one that um, was kind of the same, like the transformer of that territory to make it right for the Shinobi. Uh, in other places, it, spiritual beings take the form of like animals. So we know with the Haida, there's like the, the eagle and the raven story. Um, and you have beings, uh, so I'm, I, I should have mentioned, I'm sorry. I'm in, I'm in a Salish territory, right? I happen to live in Vancouver, but I'm in Salish territory, um, connected here to my daughter, right? In her mother's culture, Stalo culture, they had the idea of Hals. These were very, very powerful spiritual beings that transformed the world around them. They sometimes, it kind of like shapeshifters, sometimes would take the, the form of certain animals and, and such. But the idea is that there was a transformation to make the world right for humans. And that's important, right? We gotta understand that the world had to be a certain condition or set of conditions had to be created for the world to be right for us. And when we talk about these transformations, um, what we're talking about is what we're leading up to is this idea of balance, right? Uh, for the world to have the right conditions for us, we had to achieve certain balances within uh, the interactions of life in the world. So let me, let me give you an example. Um, we know when, let's, let's talk about the population levels of like predator and prey. We know when there's a lot of prey animals, like a rabbit, for instance, uh, you'll see the predator populations go up. But there's a point where the, po the predator population gets too big and there's not enough prey. So obviously the prey, their population collapses, but the, po the predator population collapses as well because there's no longer the food they need to sustain, it, right? So there's this delicate back and forth to create a balance between predator and prey. Uh, and that, you know, it takes period, a long time before those population levels come into the right balance, come to the right place where they can sustain themselves without going through these collapse. Uh, in some places, that is the pattern. You know, you have the population growth, you have the population collapse, and you have it restart. And that is the natural pattern. But nonetheless, you have this idea that 
a certain balance had to be created. And not just between the interaction of a few species, you're talking about all the life of that territory. They're all interacting, everything from insects to plants, to animals, to fish, to birds, everything around it is interacting that has to achieve a certain balance. The aim of the balance, and I'm gonna use a, a, one of my friend's terms, and this is coming from Glenn Cuther. Um, and he, he explains the, the kind of the outcome that we're trying to achieve with this balance. And it's around relationships. And he speaks of it as uh, mutually beneficial, non-exploitive relationships. So when there is a balance where life within that territory on the land can all live together in mutually beneficial ways that are non-exploitive, that's the state, you're, that's the outcome you're trying to achieve. That's the balance you're trying to get to. Um, and we see this happen. We've seen it happen in our lifetimes. And I'll give you a good example. Uh, when wolves, as predators, were feared and they were hunted a great deal uh, to the point where, you know, you have population collapse, uh, not extinction, but population collapse. Uh, we see in places like Wyoming, there was a change, a change in the habitat, change in the, the ecology of the area. Later, when the wolves were reintroduced, we saw, within a very short time, a change in the landscape. Because of the wolves and their interaction with the world around them, they had changed the landscape. And that was restoring. That's trying to restore that balance and bring it back. So there are uh, um, a web, a complex web of these interactions that have to take place that balance each other out. And when that's achieved, this, this very delicate balance, when that is achieved, we could call that outcome natural order. I guess it's a way of saying it. I'm going to say the word nature and natural a lot, only because English doesn't have the same terminology as indigenous languages. And it's kind of hard to explain it and make distinctions in the correct ways. So if I say the word natural order, I'm talking about an outcome of balance. And when this balance is maintained, when it comes in, in effect, like systemized and it's maintained, we could talk about it as being like harmony, right? All parts, meaning all life, has a role to play in maintaining these relationships in a good way. So that would be like natural balance and harmony that we think of, right? Now, natural law plays into this because if you could think about the conditions that make up natural order, this outcome of the balance and harmony, if you could think of natural law as they're really relationship protocols when we talk about these laws, they are how do we interact with the world around us correctly? And if we think of natural laws as we have to uphold them to maintain those conditions of their natural balance and harmony. Now, why would that, you know, why would we go out of our way to do that? Well, if I could get you to imagine 1491, what did the Americas look like in 1491? Well, I think, you know, all the European discoverers would have all said the same thing had they used a, this kind of language. They would refer to it like an ecological paradise. I mean, I know in their eyes, they just saw like a free for all. They saw resources they could grab and commodify and all of a sudden. So they didn't have a value around ecology, right, or an environment. Uh, but in essence, what we're talking about is an ecological paradise. That is the outcome of natural order and harmony. And it's maintained by abiding by the natural laws that are the protocols that we find in our culture. A, a, a foreign worldview and a foreign language and trying to, uh, trying to say that. Um, but I'm going to expand beyond that. So we say, you know, there's this idea of, of natural laws. And one of the reasons we had to really pay attention to it is because that natural balance is easy. It's fragile, right? It, it, it's, it's finely tuned and fragile. And it could be thrown out of whack easily. I mean, you could have anything from bad behaviors of, of uh, large groups of people 
that could cause, um, obviously, you know, like certain species to become extinct in their area. It could be um, natural disasters could cause a huge uh, uh, problem within that balance. And it'll take time to restore it actively and with effort, take time to restore that natural balance. Um, you could have invasive species. We see this all over the world, right? Where some species brought in, it doesn't have a natural predator and it completely upsets the balance in that area. Um, or you could have like an ecocidal invasion happening on your lands that is intent on destroying the entire uh, environment and ecology of your area and your territory. So natural order and, and the balance and harmony that, that's, that's part of that uh, is really fragile. It, it's, it's, it's so finely tuned that it could be knocked out of whack by a single species. So natural laws are there to ensure that we sustain that system to make it happen. Now, we are not the only players in this, this idea of natural law and natural order. Uh, nature itself, when I'm speaking about um, animals. So I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're aware indigenous people have an animistic view of the world. So all things have life and spirit. So I could be talking about the ground. I could be talking about the mountains, the river, um, the trees, the rocks. They all have a form of spirit that could be interacted with. Um, if I say the word communicate with, we tend to think, oh, it's going to speak to me. No, 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 no. It's way beyond that. It's, it's so much more than just the idea of a, a, a rock talking to me, right? It's not like that. Um, but nature itself abide by, abides by these ideas of natural laws. And nature was here way before us, right? If we think about it, we are the little brothers, little sisters, or you can say like the little nieces and nephews of this world. In front of us, what has come before us are all these animals, all these plants, uh, the soil, the rocks, the insects. They were here long before we ever stepped foot onto the world stage. They carry with them wisdom, teachings. And in a lot of our cultures, creation gave them the responsibility to teach us, much like we would be a mentor to a little brother, sister, or a little niece or nephew. They've taken on that role of being like the, the uncles and aunties of the world to show us the way, to show us how do we as humans fit within a pre-existing order? How do we fit within that natural order? It has so much balance and harmony that becomes so nourishing to all life around us, right? Every single piece of life in, or every part of life in that territory has a role to play in that. And that's critical. And as we said, you know, one species, if you remove them from that system, could cause the whole thing to fall, fall apart, right? So they have that responsibility to teach us. And in a lot of our cultures, and again, I'm not trying to speak for every indigenous nation, but a lot of our cultures, um, we have the idea of the, the original instructions. And what that meant was at the dawn of humans, uh, spiritually, we were given this idea of how to, or not an idea, a responsibility that we had to maintain the world, this natural order and the way it was, we had to take care of it. We had to manage it. We had to look out for it. And we do so to maintain it for the next seven generations. That's just a way, when we say next seven generations, that's a way of just saying like forever, uh, perpetually. It's a way of saying that this needs to go on. I, I hate the word to say sustainable because we know that word has been hijacked so much by industry, right? But in such a way that it goes on and on and on, way beyond the way we could imagine in terms of time. So perpetually it continues on. So we as humans have to learn natural law. We have to learn how do I take my human life and fit it into a pre-existent order that's been here for millions of years before me, has achieved a state of balance and harmony. How do I as a human learn to fit into that? Not how do I change it, disrupt it, or force it to my will and conform it and transform it into something that I could exploit and use. It's the exact opposite. It's not human centric. It's nature centric. We as humans have to learn how to, how to 
fit into that pre-existing natural order. And that's what learning natural law becomes, right? And animals and all life had this responsibility to teach us. And that's what this connection became with nature. And these are just people that learn how to turn to nature to, to learn how to be a part of it in a good way. And you'll probably hear me say that a lot because elders say that. And it sounds so simple when they talk about living life in a good way. What they're really talking about is much more complex. They're talking about how to live life according to his teachings. And these teachings are based on natural law. Um, that very connection is so important too. And I, I, gotta, I gotta speak to that a little bit to really try to catch the complexity of this. Um, our territories, uh, uh, as indigenous people, I could say we are the voice of our territories. We are the ones that could tell you the, the stories, the histories, the ceremonies which come from the land. We could tell you um, the lessons, the natural law of how to live within that specific territory because different territories are you know, uh, different. So for instance, if I'm in a desert territory, there are different skills, there are different teachings how to live in a desert than there are in a coastal temperate rainforest, right? There's different lessons and that's what kind of shapes our cultures, right? But we learn the natural law of being there. And the um, being indigenous in your territory meant that you had a very special connection and it just didn't mean you lived there first. Because I know that's what it gets reduced to and it's not. It really meant that we had to pursue something. I gave you some indigenous words. So in my language, we say ilnu to mean the people. Um, but it meant more than that. It meant like, Complete. It's, it's indigenous people, but complete. Uh, the Mohawks used the word "ongo uh, In my daughter's territory, it's "homo." You could go to New China territory, and it's "kuas," and it meant like a complete person. But what does that mean, complete? Right? And that meant you had all the teachings of the land, and the land we helped you become complete. And when I say complete, I mean complete human, right? So the teachings helped you become this complete person, this complete human, but you could only access those teachings in certain places of your land. And I'll give you one quick example, because there's a lot, uh, coming of age ceremonies. If I can't access very specific sites that have specific teachings on my land, I can't even become an adult. You had to be at certain places to learn certain teachings to come of age. So to continue to go through this development or growth as a human, I had to access so many different sacred sites, historical sites, cultural sites. To walk through our land was more than a physical experience. It was a cultural experience. It was a spiritual experience. It was a very complete experience for a person. And to become a complete human, you really had to access so many different parts. And it's, it wasn't just like at a community level. You had, to, you, know, you had to travel throughout your nation to access so many different areas that allowed you to continue on this journey to develop yourself as a complete human. And within these teachings, is, you know, being human also means knowing our place within the existing natural order. So it, it's very critical to become indigenous fully in this complete sense we have to be able to access all our territory, not just reserves and communities, but all our territory, because those territories were there to teach us how to be this person. Now, to become that complete human was a good thing, was a really good thing, right? And that's generally what our elders a long time ago were really looked up to because they have completed or definitely gone much further than us in that process. And we could turn to their wisdom and their wisdom came from the land, right? Now, the land had shaped us so well that we have to engage in another principle, and that's reciprocity. And that means you give back. You take care of, you take care of that relationship, right? And if we go back to the original instructions where we say um, taking care of the land for the next generations, this is where we start to talk about the idea of protection. In 1491, our people didn't necessarily have to worry about another indigenous group invading our land and committing um, ecocide, right? That just didn't fall within the worldview. There was, there was no, there wasn't this idea of completely destroying a landscape 
to commodify it. So that it, it, it's 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 pretty foreign in that sense to think of, right? So when we said protect the land, we really meant you know protect the the, the order it's in for our next seven generations. Nowadays, though, we've been exposed to colonial invasion and the ecocidal practices of capitalism, where we have to really kind of you know uh, 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 really engage on the protection side now. Because the land itself is on the verge uh, of entering into a, a state of oblivion. So protection becomes so much more than just simply managing, right? And that's important because that's that's kind of what compels us to action as opposed to just being out there and trying to help manage and take care of the land, right? So we get compelled to action. So reciprocity around our relationship with the land is important because it's what drives this idea of protection. And... I want to get into this idea of um, responsibility too, right? Now, because as I speak about the land, I don't want you to have that idea of ownership that comes from Western thinking, ownership around private property and such, right? Like that's not how indigenous people uh, saw it. The land, it, it's hard to explain, was, wasn't open to everybody, like being a Mi'kmaq person, I couldn't just walk into Stalo territory or New Toronto territory and start cutting anything I wanted and, you know, putting down the trees and, and you know, killing all the, the, um, the deer and the moose. And I couldn't just do anything I wanted like that um, because we had this idea of responsibility to or responsibility for the land, right? And in a way, if you could replace the word ownership, with this concept of responsibility for, because that goes back to the original instructions that we manage and have responsibility to land for the next seven generations. Well, responsibility too could be on an individual level. Like as an individual, I might be in charge of um, taking care of a fishing site. Uh, most time it was family or clan level where you were taking care of hunting grounds, fishing sites, foraging areas, sacred sites. Um, like we talk about the coming of age ceremonial cultural sites. You were in charge of these things, and different clans were in charge of different sites. Uh, different communities were in charge of different sites. And this would work its way up into a complex web at national level. So, the, say, for instance, the Mi'kmaq Nation would have a complex web of uh, communities that all manage different areas, different sites, and they were responsible to them. Right. And that's what it meant. So I don't want you, I don't want you to think ownership, but I do want you to think responsible too. Uh, and this is important because if I go into somebody else's territory, I had to ask permission. And this is this is really key because land became an, an important tool in creating good relationships. So if I want to go hunt elk in somebody's territory, I didn't just go do it. I would have to talk to whoever was responsible to that area, that hunting ground. And I would have to establish a good relationship with them. It wasn't transactional. I just don't say, here, take this, and I want to take some elk. Um, you had to establish a good relationship. And these relationships would go on like uh, uh, throughout generations where people could say, oh, I'm connected to so-and-so's family. I could go hunt there or I could go fish there. Right? And they're also mutually beneficial, meaning if uh, I asked somebody, can I go hunt elk in one area, I would have I would, to be respectful, I would say, listen, during the summer, come, you know, come um, fish some salmon in my area, something mutually beneficial to each other. So what it does is it lays the groundwork for governance and then managing these relationships between families and communities uh, on a national level became a really, really important part of indigenous governance. And a lot of times we had met, we would meet in these really uh, big, big gatherings. So my people call them Maui Omis. Um, I, out here in the West Coast, we hear the, we hear the word uh, potlatches, right? They weren't just social gatherings. You know, there was socializing that took place. But these are gatherings that went on for days or weeks. And governance took place on regional and national level governance, where natural law was at the forefront of talking about how do we manage areas how do we manage our hunting sites our fishing sites how do we manage these all in a good way how do we make sure that we manage the relationships that have already been established in a good way so you know redress and, and the ways of working things out would take place there 
Um, but it, this is critical component because a lot of times when we talk about conservation or protecting the land, we exclude the idea of indigenous governance. You got to understand indigenous governance was about, I, mean, I, I hate the word enforcing, it sounds so coercive, but enforcing natural law within the territory in such a way that the natural order and harmony is maintained. So if we want that ecological paradise of 1491, we have to go back to this idea of restoring the legitimate government of the land, the voice of this land. And that's the indigenous traditional governments. And that means not just the people and leadership, that means the practices. That's the most important part, the practices, the principles, the protocols. Um, we have to reestablish the worldview that got us to see nature with such reverence. We have to reestablish the spiritualism that came behind that. And of course, the cultural protocols and all the norms that became associated with them. So talking about taking on uh, a capitalist industry and such, um, it's only one part of this fight. Because let's say, you know, let's say by chance you're successful and capitalist industry is now removed from the equation. Well, we all know the term that power abhors a vacuum. What's in its place? What is going to be pushed there? And will that be the legitimate governing system of this land? Will it be the voice of this land? And, and I'd have to say, if you're going to do any work around confronting colonial industries, you have to engage in the idea of uh, traditional governance, traditional indigenous governance, because that was the form or the system of governance that put natural law as its foundation. So if we want to understand how do we recreate the landscape that was an ecological paradise, we have to create the authority, we have to recreate the power, we have to create the practices around traditional indigenous governance that was the system of governance that created that very landscape, right? Because it knew how to live with, with the land in a good way. So we have to be able to talk about bringing that back, right? So earlier I mentioned the idea of protection because we know now that's not going to happen on its own. Capitalist industry is not going to suddenly say, oh, wow, uh, you guys really know what you're doing. It comes down to relating to nature. So go ahead, take back all the land, take back all the resources, and it's all yours. We, we know that's not going to happen. So we have to talk about the idea of what do we do in terms, like what is the motivation, the purpose behind trying to protect that? And for us, for, for, for indigenous people, it is about this responsibility we have to the land and protecting that land. Because right now, in the state we're in, I can't turn over the land to the next seven generations in the same state I received it. I was born in 1968, and the world is not the world it was of 1968. And by far, that wasn't good enough. We know that, right? Um, but I can't even hand it over to the next generations in a state that it was in when I was born, because we know there's been all kinds of, of species depopulation. There's been all kinds of uh, pollution damage, just toxic uh, 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 damage to the world in the last five decades, right? So protection means we have to take a much more active stance of how do we stop these harms? How do we start to restore the world to what it used to be? And obviously that's a lot of action and it's not going to happen because it, you will be in a contest with capitalist colonial industries that do not want to give up that land and they will use force to maintain it. So protection does include the idea of self-defense and force. Um, and it's not just a choice. It's not just a, yeah, I think I'll do that. For us, it was an obligation. We refer to that as a sacred responsibility. We have a sacred responsibility to protect this land. Now, I, I, I could go on and on with a lot of this stuff, but I, I just want to hit on a couple quick points real, uh, real fast here. Um, let me just, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll do this. My experience, it's my personal experience over the last three or four decades, um, working with non-Indigenous allies has been sometimes difficult. And I'm sure you probably heard that this, this tension, I suppose, right? And let me explain this. What I have seen in a lot of cases 
is an environmentalist, a non-indigenous environmentalist view of terra nullius. So if you're not familiar with that term, that's basically the uh, Europe's principle around international relations. They, they could basically come in and take land if it's uninhabited. Now, and that's what the term, you know, basically translates to terra nullius being uninhabited land. Uh, but when it came to the Americas, obviously it wasn't uninhabited. We're talking over a hundred million people here. Excuse me. But they had to dehumanize us in their view to ensure that it is uninhabited. They had to ignore us. They had to, well, exterminate. They had to um, push us away in, in campaigns of ethnic cleansing. They had to free or open up the land to make it so that it fits this concept of uninhabited. And my experience with a lot of environmental groups that are not in business is they carry some of that colonial baggage. They act as if this is free open land to do whatever they want with. By doing so, you are bypassing, avoiding or ignoring the legitimate governing systems of this land or the people of the land. You're ignoring the natural order. You're ignoring the natural laws. You are recolonizing. In a way, it's no different than some capitalist industry coming onto our land and encroaching upon it. Um, you're, you're practicing the same kind of principles that they abide by, right? And I'm going to encourage you not to be the green ropes. Uh, don't come in with the intent or with the understanding in your minds that this is all open and free land to do what you want, to take up whatever action you want to take, um, because it isn't. This, this land has a voice, it has an authority, and it's, it's being um, channeled through indigenous people. Uh, so it, it's critical you don't carry that view because that's colonial baggage that becomes such a big barrier in any kind of relationships good relationships, those mutually beneficial, non-exploitive relationships I'm talking about, right? And that's a huge barrier to that relationship. And um, I, I think, I'm going to say something, and I'm, I do this once in a while, is sometimes I can say some harsh stuff, right? If you're non-Indigenous, your status on this land is that of occupier, colonial occupier. Right, not settler, not a uh, visitor, not guest. I never sent out any invitations. Um, you're an occupier. The, the reason you're on the land is because it was taken by force. Our governments were overthrown. Our systems were, in effect, almost destroyed. Right, uh, but it doesn't have to stay that way. You can transform that relationship. You could establish a good relationship with indigenous people, and we actively try to. Like the word Mi'kmaq for my people. It's not our original word. Our original word was ilmi, but post-contact, the word Mi'kmaq was, was used. And it means kinsmen or kinship. Because from our point of view, we were always trying to make relatives. We were always trying to connect with people and bring them in and be inclusive within our culture and our lands. So I'm gonna encourage you to, uh, I could say the word redeem, or I could say shake off the, status of being an occupier upon this land and seek to create new relationships, good, mutually beneficial, non-exploited relationships with the legitimate voice and authority of the land, ones that have the real responsibility to the land, and that's indigenous people. And that might shape how you do actions. That might shape how you go about and, and take on new objectives, because it really should be very much informed and, and in effect, I'm going to say the word permission, but that's such a Western word, but given sanction, permission, by the indigenous people of that territory, right? So I'm going to encourage you to go about and do that, because once we could reestablish indigenous governance on the land, then we could start talking about how do we build this world back into an ecological paradise it used to be. All right, so I'm imagining I've probably used up quite a bit of my time, but I want to thank you. Umsit Nugama all my relations. Doc Edge, thank you very much. Really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Always a, always a great pleasure to hear you speak. Uh, the first time I heard Sock Edge was, I believe, in 2012 at the Unistoten camp mm -hmm. up in what's now known as British Columbia on Wet'suwet'en territory. 
and uh, and I was blown away. So uh, ever since, I've been very happy whenever we get a chance to speak and meet in person, and uh, I hope everything's well with you. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everyone. So we are going to take a quick break. We've been on for a while. I need a quick bathroom break, and probably some of the viewers do too. So we're going to take about a five-minute break. When we come back, we're going to hear from Ann Keala Kelly, who's a, a Kanaka Maui native Hawaiian, I believe that's the right term, um, who's going to be speaking about some of her perspectives on these issues. Then we're going to hear from Derek Jensen, Alan Clements, and move towards the end of the event. So uh, we're going to take a brief intermission. I'm going to put up a countdown video in the meantime. And if folks want to donate during the break, the link is in the Facebook chat. And we will be back in a few minutes. Thank you.
Okay, everyone, we are coming back online here. We're going to start up our event again. Thank you for sticking with us through that break. I needed to get some water. The next speaker who I am very happy to introduce is Ann Kayala Kelly. Kayala is a filmmaker. She's a journalist, podcaster, and writer. Her published articles and op-eds have appeared in many different newspapers and magazines. Her broadcast journalism has been aired all over the world, and she's a frequent guest commentator on First Voices Indigenous Radio, now known as First Voices Radio, actually, and other radio programs. Her reporting has earned her a Native American Journalism Award, and her documentary, Noho Hewa, The Wrongful Occupation of Hawaii, has received International Film Festival Awards and is very well worth the watch. I highly recommend that film. So, Kayla, I'm so glad you're with us. Hey, aloha, Max. Can you hear me okay? You're coming through loud and clear. Absolutely. So I was hoping to speak with you today about the topics, the theme of this event. And um, we were discussing before we got on the live and we came up with a few different topics we wanted to dive into. One of them was the spiritual and political intersection between uh, the, the destruction of the land, uh, the so-called environment, uh, as it's known in our culture and human exploitation of it. And uh, you also mentioned that you wanted to talk about Lahaina. I know that you living in Hawaii and being uh, being a native person, that you have an, uh, a perspective that not many people hear in this country. And that's one of the reasons why I think that your uh, your film and your work is so incredibly important in bringing to light the history of the occupation and and supposed annexation of Hawaii mm -hmm. and what that has meant for the people and the land. Well, thank you for that, Max. Um, gosh, I wouldn't even just a little bit you just said right now, you know, I'm following Sockage Ward, which in future lets let me go first because there's just no point. I could just say everything Sockage said, moving on, because he really covered a lot of territory that's exactly like what I've experienced here and what I see happening here. I, I want to echo what he said about pan-indigeneity. I think that's a huge mistake. I think all that um, pan-indigeneity ends up doing is profiting the state and helping the state's agenda, which is very divisive. It, it does not it, it doesn't really end up help, helping real resistance movement as far as I can tell. It helps natives that are already in, in the institutions that are the state. And you know, one of the things that comes to mind, you know, when you're reminding about our conversation, it's like there is an intersection. Be, there's all kinds of intersections between things. There's the political, the cultural, the spiritual, the environmental. And then there's this institutional thing that happens that comes from the occupiers, governmental, societal, legal systems. And so we're on the bottom of that. And our experiences are different for every single specific indigenous group. Our histories are different. And what's happened, I think, because of pan-indigeneity, -indigen which a lot of that just comes out of academia or institutional natives, what happens is everything just gets whittled down into one small, little, easily digestible thing that the occupying or settler colonial population can digest. I mean, they're just, they're happy when it gets like, oh, here's the indigenous, you know, and they don't have to think about the complexities behind that. Um, I also agreed with what he said about cultural commodification. I mean, it's hard to speak to anything anymore because it just gets scooped up by this bulldozer system that just sees anything that they can just decorate with culture and then go here it's that's it hawaiians have spoken look the most popular hawaiian cultural practitioners have weighed in and now they want to lead the desecration of mauna kea that's how it gets done and so it's incredibly frustrating at this time it's never not been frustrating but i feel like it's worse now or it seems worse to me and I guess it's because Lahaina broke my heart. I didn't know my heart was capable of another break in that way. But it took me a couple of weeks just to get up, just to get myself sort of even again, because it was so 
it still is such a painful, immeasurably just devastating thing that happened there. And I don't just mean the fire. I also mean the response to it, which was very institutional, very nonprofit industrialized, very state, very Oprah Winfrey, Dwayne Johnson. I don't mean to cast aspersions on famous rich people, but when your answer to dealing with something like that catastrophe is to hump Oprah Winfrey, you're already like in so much trouble at that point. And so I saw these like leadership, Hawaiian leadership, people considered leaders, people considered political and cultural voices of the people, not bringing the real cause of that fire and the cause of Hawaiian resistance to the conversation. They just let the system dictate how it's gonna be narrated. So now it's just an environmental issue. Oh, well, there's a drought. Oh, well, plantation economy. There's all this other nonsense that gets to be front and center and nobody talks about the occupation. Nobody talks about the system of militarized occupation here. And so then here's the whole world looking at this terrible event and thinking, how fast can we rebuild? They're not thinking about the desecration. They're not thinking about any of the actual historical and political things that really are, have caused this and that should be addressed right now. And then you get these like native people representing. So somebody like me comes in and talks the way I'm talking to you right now. And I just sound like, you know, I end up being the most radical person in any conversation and I'm not even saying anything that isn't completely true. But for some reason, I'd say, especially since the technology of social media, whatever resistance I was a part of 20 something years ago has been co-opted completely by the state and by the nonprofit industrial complex. So, so it's a really painful thing to say because I can't, I'm not really sure even how to narrate. In fact, I'm not even sure if I should narrate anymore any of what's gone on because I'm looking for resistance. And I mean real resistance, by the way. I don't just mean like the decorative kind. Um, and it's it's right now it's in short supply. People, you know, right now, if you think about what's happening in the Middle East, this is a perfect example, Max. Gosh, I'm not even letting you get a word in edgewise. But let me say this one last thing and please ask me a question. But like if you think about the Middle East and what's happening there and what's in the what's in the language that they're using, settler colonialism. They say it over and over again about Palestine. Now, okay if that's the words they want to use. But as somebody who is in a place where, you know, they keep talking about occupation of Palestine. Oh, it's the longest occupation in history. No, it isn't. The longest occupation, at least of a nation state, is here in Hawaii. It's been going on for 130 years. The United States has been illegally occupying Hawaii, a nation state, not just a state of indigenous peoples, or people rather, the Hawaiian people, but an actual nation state. So if our nation state and our history doesn't matter, then whose does? So now they're narrating Palestine and they're saying longest occupation in history. And the reason they're saying that, Max, is because Hawaiians are not speaking up and out about the occupation. It's not because they're being rude or dismissive. It's because Hawaiians are not resisting. And if they are, it isn't visible. And as a media person, I can tell you, it's only gotten harder and harder to represent any kind of Hawaiian resistance in media. And I'm a journalist and a filmmaker and I can't get anything going on. You know, one of your guests later today, uh, Teokasin Ghost Horse, I started shooting a project, a project on Teokasin. Funding, you know, getting enough support to actually see something through is incredibly hard. And I'm finding it the past 10 years to be impossible. So, and then I think, well, I should just stop. And then I look around and I don't see any other person maybe talking like I'm talking with the skills that I have. And so then I'm not really sure where to land, right? So, you know, it's all, it's all very complex and, and, and distressing right now. I, you know, I love the topic of this, you know, spirituality and ecology, you know, the soul, the spirit, it has its own, it is its own part of the ecosystem of my body, of this place. We're already a part of it. And we've been forced for, you know, however long the Euro-American project of destroying the planet and native peoples has been going on, what, five centuries of this nonsense and this bullshit of capitalism. Like, it's not 
a doable economic system. It is entirely based on destroying everything for profit. So and when we can't really speak to these things by just centering some of the, like the economic system or the cultural reality or the history of Euro-American domination of the globe or militarism, and we can't just at least start with like, well, what's destroying the world? You know, the biggest polluter in the world is the American military. Oh, but wait, we have to like, you know, talk about the state of Israel's right to exist or whatever. The whole conversation, everything just gets turned into something other than what it is. A genocide is a genocide. You know, ecocide in the Pacific is everywhere. It's rampant. In Hawaii, it's just look outside my door and I see it. It's everywhere. So. When, then those, when those of us who are resisting or trying to resist, when we can't really even communicate effectively with actual truth-telling media, it shouldn't, it shouldn't impoverish me. It's impoverished me for more than two decades to do what I've done because I can't be in an institution. I can't go to work at the state because then I get swallowed up by that. And so I can't join like some you know part of the community. I have to maintain some independence in order to see the whole thing and, and, and stay truthful to it and not join the cult of personality that Hawaiian cultural anything becomes, you know, and it's a very, very difficult thing to even consider doing anymore. But, you know, culturally and spiritually, I do have to come back to a few things that I still know, you know, for us, it's genealogical. Um, I think Sakaj was talking quite a bit about that without maybe using that word. You know, somebody spoke earlier about the mountain lion, you know, a sign. I mean, for Hawaiians, we call that ho'ailona. And ho'ailona is when you see in nature, you know, something in nature talks to you and it communicates to you, uh, either confirming or, you know, putting you off or whatever, just thanking or just getting your attention. You know, for Hawaiians, I mean, we live in this Judeo-Christian society where it's all just down, comes down to a guy on a cross or, you know, Judaism, and it's all in that book, right? Well, before that got here, you know, Hawaiian world, this complex world had what we call it the Kino Lao. There's 400,000 gods and goddesses. Every living thing here had a name and it's considered a spiritual entity unto itself. We say ecosystem, but we're really talking about life everything in life you know whether it was the clouds you know showing you a rainbow there's a certain kind of rainbow there's dozens of different kinds of rainbows and they all have their own meaning and their own name and everything hawaiians being here for thousands of years had a name for everything and it wasn't just as easy as moana meaning the ocean kanaloa is our god throughout the pacific really a god of the ocean well that that god is represented by every living entity the whales the fish the, everything Everything in that ocean is Kanaloa. And so there's not one speck of our existence as a people that is not totally under siege at all times. And so, you know, it's it's hard to, it gets harder and harder. And I, I don't know, I, I guess I imagined 24 years ago that things would be easier by now and they're only harder. And so I can say, yeah, let's bring back the Ahupua'a system. That's how Hawaiians live you know, mountain to the sea, how to use the water to grow food and still let the water get to the ocean so that the fish could get it, you know, the fish that live in the brackish water could get what they need. I don't even know how to talk about this stuff anymore because it's like putting a Band-Aid on something to say, yeah, ahupua'a, yeah, culture, yeah, indigenous. That's, it's, we're dealing with a monster of a system. We're dealing with a, a a woman hating, people of color hating, earth hating, ocean hating system of logic. And so I don't know. I want to be spiritual. Really, I think I still have a soul. I'm still alive. I must still have a soul in there. But it's lately it's been very hard. <laughs> it's been very hard to, to know how to proceed. So I haven't really been like pushing very much lately especially since Lahaina because it just it just broke something in my spirit you know just seeing the event itself and then seeing the way it got narrated by democracy now and the Hawaiians who went on that or any major news 
source, you know, the way it got talked about, it just was just, I just looked at that and I was like, I felt like, you know, I've done almost 24 years and I thought, wow, I've just wasted 24 years of my life. That's honestly how I felt. Not that it's about me. I don't mean to make it about me, but I was having a physical, spiritual kind of experience of it, you know, just, it just, and it just was such a disheartening in every way. So anyways, sorry for just, uh, just <laughs> unloading on you, Max. <laughs> no, it's one of the things that I really love and appreciate about you every time that we speak. And, you know, we've had you on the Green Flame podcast and, and we had you at Earth at Risk years ago. And, you know, we've, we actually haven't met in person since Earth at Risk. So it's been right. almost 10 years now. Yes. But mm -hmm. that's one of the things that I really appreciate about you is that you, um, you say what's in your heart. And so many people today don't. So many people hold themselves back and don't actually speak the truth for one reason or another. And it's, um, you know, it's something that relating it to the theme of this event, you know, one of the things that I've been grappling with is that throughout history, you see all these resistance movements and social movements, and many of them are animated by explicitly religious or spiritual practices, beliefs, understandings of the world. Um, you know, whether you're talking about Harriet Tubman or uh, or Martin Luther King, or, you know, Nat Turner, or go on down the list. Um, but even in so many of the movements that have a more secular approach that don't explicitly use that kind of language or have that kind of understanding of the world, you see this intense reverence for the sanctity of life, for justice, for human dignity, for the worth of that mountain lion of those bird species who are being driven extinct in Hawaii, which I know is where there are more endangered species than anywhere else in the so-called United States. You know, this, this reverence for this world that we're in, and that's just something that I feel from you coming out of your heart. And it's something that I think is so important to this event and really what we're trying to get at, what we're trying to awaken in people. And, uh, and so, yeah, th that's not a question, <laughs> but, mm. uh, but I just want to thank you for your work and for your words here. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Max. And yeah, I think it's an, until people, I can't even say until people do blah, blah, blah. Like I can't even like, I always like to, I feel like, no, I know that we need to problem solve. Okay. I think humans are capable of problem solving. I, I think, especially even in Hawaii, you know, Hawaiians who know better uh, are, they're so Americanized that they, they think of themselves and their own families. They don't think beyond that. Or if they do, it's just in a kind of incremental way. And oftentimes it's very transactional. Everything's become transactional in this world where, you know, if you're going to help somebody there, you know, it just, People don't just go with what they know. And we, and the Hawaiian word is na'au. You know it in your gut that you need to say or do something. And Hawaiians, I've just watched them become less and less confident about that. And I can, now that I have, you know, it, it's like you can look at things a couple of years later, I can analyze certain political things like the Mauna Kea movement. And I can say, okay, I can see where this went the wrong way and just kept going. And that happens. And then that leads into now we look at Lahaina and how that's getting done too. And some of those are the same people, you know? Um, so there's this very difficult kind of moment, I think that we're all in. If, we, if people don't recognize this moment for what it is and they don't see it for this critical moment where you have to intervene, no matter who you are, no matter what way, if they can't read the room, if they can't really see what this is, then, you know, I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know. I mean, nature will be glad to see us destroy ourselves, but you know, I don't, I don't think it needs to come to that. I do think that, you know, it, it, I do think it's incumbent upon us to actually intervene. I think I can honestly say just my own experience, by the way, I, there's three, at least $3 billion that I personally was involved in making sure some people didn't get a resort, a telescope, a movie like I know that when you intervene and you agitate 
and you put yourself out professionally and personally in one way or another, and you do it good, good enough and hard enough and sometimes mean enough, people who are trying to get a billion dollars off of that mountain, they're not going to get that billion dollars. Now, there's wreckage from doing that kind of politics, but that, that's a lot of money. And, and I've, I think that if I can do that, just me and a couple other people can intervene on something and stop it, that means it, that means people really are more powerful than the system wants them to think they are. People really can stop something or at least delay it so long that nobody wants to do it. You know, it just, we're, people are hypnotized, I think, by media and by, mainly by media, you know, into thinking that somehow it's supposed to be all pretty and have a certain kind of feel to it. They don't understand, you know, when you're, uh, you come from a community that's losing all the time and tries to make it seem like they're not losing. Cause if you go, yeah, I'm losing, then you lose something. You feel like you don't have your dignity or something. You know, if you come from that kind of a situation, it's very hard to talk those kind of people into really challenging the state or any kind of system directly and being a threat to it. And that's where I, you know, I, I think if you're not going to be a threat, I mean, you have to be willing to be a threat to the system is what I'm saying. So, so I don't know, we're just at this, I don't want to say an inflection point because that makes it sound like there's something on the other side. I don't know what's on the other side, Max, you know, I just know in this moment, boy, (laughs) boy, is the news not good, you know, but if you were to get any other Hawaiian here to talk to you, they would tell you I was wrong. You know, they would tell you things are better and and I'm saying not really, you know, I mean, you know, the value system is the same. All they end up really doing is protecting the state. They end up just protecting the state's interests, really, by not cha- by saying, no, we need to help this one issue or this one group of people right now. They end up protecting the thing that's doing it to them. And so. You know, I know we all need to connect across movements. I know that we all need to be able to find common ground, even if we don't agree on anything. That's probably the only hope is if we can come together and say, okay, I don't agree with, you know, whether it's DGR or whatever. Oh, I don't agree on this and this, but you know what? This issue, I totally agree with them on and they agree with me. I'm in, you know, and until we can at least give ourselves permission to do those kinds of, you know, um, have those kinds of relationships and not expect a, only a specific outcome. You know, it has to be a certain way, you know, until we can do that, we're, you know, we're, a lot of us are just trapped, you know, we're just trapped in the occupier, the settler colonial system. We're trapped in the system of the oppressor and we have to call it what it is and undermine it somehow. And that's just become really unpopular and impolite to say now. You know, and I'll tell you, 20 years ago, Hawaiians were in the streets. You know, now Hawaiians are, you know, on Facebook Mm. and that's not the same thing. Mm. So anyways, I really appreciate you having me on the show. I know I've probably already gone over time. I don't know if you have any other any other questions. You're we're we're a little bit behind schedule as usual for this time in the event, (laughs) which I totally expected and I'm not stressed out about one bit. So I hope folks will stick around for a little while longer. We've got a few more speakers, but I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much for your work. And uh, yeah, it's been great, Max. Yeah, yeah. I I um I want to transition to introducing our next speaker, who's Derek Jensen, and I want to relate some of his work in the introduction to um, to something Kiala said, which is the importance of, of listening when you have those interactions with, whether it's the mountain lion, like Deanna was telling us about earlier, or, or um, you know, in my experience with Thacker Pass, I had a, I had a, what I could only call a vision. It seems, I feel strange or, or somehow like I'm trying to be egotistical or something if I say that. But I had I, whether it's dreaming or imagination or um, whether it's uh, messages sent by the land, I don't know to what extent there is a distinction at a certain point. Um, but I, what led me to to do what I did at Thacker Pass to fight in this campaign for the past three years now was not didn't come autonomously from inside myself it came in relationship from land it came in this dynamic interplay between me and a place and there's something 
where in our modern culture that gets lost, where people are so attached to their screens all the time, listening to podcasts and music and never putting aside the the distractions of this culture and having a direct relationship with the other beings all around us, whether that's the birds or the deer or a mountain or a river or a beach or a stone, and just taking it in, taking it in on its own terms. And the reason I want to use that to introduce Derek Jensen is because Derek is one of the people who invited me to do that for the first time in a deliberate way. Um, I still remember many years ago, it's almost 15 years ago now that I first heard Derek speak, and he invited me to listen to the natural world, to engage in relationship to the natural world, and to be patient with that process, to not expect it to be dramatic. Um, he gave me permission to do something that is not normal in this culture. In fact, it's considered very abnormal, but it's incredibly important. And in the scale of human history, on this planet of our species, it is the most normal thing imaginable. So um, I would like to introduce Derek Jensen. He's the author of more than 25 books. This bio might be quite out of date by now, so it might be closer to 30. Um, he is a, a, a teacher, activist, and small farmer, and was once named the poet philosopher of the ecological movement. He's a co-founder of Deep Green Resistance, has written for a bunch of different publications. He has a MFA in creative writing from Eastern Washington University and a BS in mineral engineering physics from the Colorado School of Mines, <laughs> which he often says emphasis on the BS, right? <laughs> right, Derek? And he taught creative writing at Eastern Washington University in the Pelican Bay State Prison. So Derek, so glad to have you with us. Oh, thanks for having me. And thanks for as always, for your tremendous work, Max, it, uh, as I always say, uh, DGR wouldn't exist without you. If, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're the heart soul of it. So I guess, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I guess I'll start with something that I wrote just last night. So it's, it's very rough. Um, and I'm going to stop after the first sentence, too, because I want to think about it for a second. Anyway, what I wrote last night is, there is no wild place in the world that is not beautiful. And before I go on, let's just let's just think about that for a second. Cause and I'm gonna go on about some places I don't really like, but I was like, I was I spent probably a half hour on that line last night just trying to test it. Is there any wild place I've ever seen? It doesn't mean I have to like the place, but is there any wild place I've ever seen that isn't beautiful? And I I couldn't think of any. Anyway, um, there is no wild place in the world that is not beautiful. The high desert of Nevada is too open for me, but I've never denied the soft, sensual beauty of the weathered sage and pinion pine covered hills, the life changing clarity of the air and of the silence. And have you ever seen the stars in the desert or the moon? Likewise, I'm not a fan of wading waist deep in murky, slow moving water. It makes me nervous to not see who's swimming around my feet but fireflies flashing through a thickening mist between black on black shadows of bald cypress trunks on a hot, wet night stirs something in my belly. And grasslands too are too open for me, but I've stood silent and transfixed at the side of hill after hill of tall grasses bending and rising in the undulating wind, listening to meadowlarks and red-winged blackbirds and the wind, always the speaking of the wind. There is no wild place, from icy stretches to black sand beaches to salt flats to rivers so wide you cannot see across, that does not give up its beauty freely to all. And what that's a setup for in the book I'm working on is to talk about, yeah, I love all those, but there are some places that are home. And when you see them, you just, you feel like you've come home, even if you see them for the first time. And for me, that's that's forests. Um, anyway, so that's that's what I wrote last night. And then to the to the question of of listening to the land and how we listen, I don't think it's really any different than how do we listen to humans? We just pay attention. We just step outside and we attend. And I, I don't mean even uh, you know, 
like digging little pits in the ground and see counting which insects fall in. I'm just talking about observing like about a week or two ago, I saw what looked like a life and death struggle between a banana slug and a Pacific sideband snail. And by the way, I didn't even know it was called a Pacific sideband. I thought that was a redwood snail until I looked up redwood snail. And there is no such thing. Anyway, so I thought a, a life and death struggle, which seemed weird to me because I thought they were both uh, um, detritivores. And um, then it, it was pretty interesting because it looked like the banana slug was crawling up on top of the snail and eating the snail. But the banana slug also looked... Uh, very ill. There's a color that banana slugs get when they're when they're um, when they're not feeling well or when they're dead, and it had that color. But still, its mouth was up top. I realized later that I was. I went back out about a half hour later, and they were. I was completely misconstruing the scene. Though what was happening was actually kind of cool, not for the banana slug. The banana slug was dead, and the. Pacific sideband snail couldn't eat through, they, they eat detritus, they eat dead things, and it couldn't eat through the mantle. So it's pretty smart. It was using its body to go up underneath the banana slug to flip it over so it could get to the, to the belly. And that's all I mean by paying attention. That's all that listening to land, that's where it starts is just, who are your neighbors? And, you know, when, when, my mom and I first moved to the land where she lived for the rest of her life and where I'll live for the rest of my life. You know, one of the questions that we were asking is how do we make it so the non-humans are glad that we live here? And it's really no different than how do you make it so the humans who live next to you, you know, anytime some new neighbor moves in, you're always kind of nervous. It's like, are they going to be jerks? Are they going to be nice? Are they going to be? And you just start paying attention to them. You just ask them what they need. You ask them what they want. And it's no different with non-humans. There's two directions I want to go with this. One of them is that um, when I went to write a language older than words, or since writing a language older than words, as so many people have asked me at talks, like, how do you communicate with non-humans? And I always ask them, have you ever had a dog or a cat? And They'll say, yeah, usually. I say, how did the dog or cat tell you that the water dish was empty? Well, they look at the water dish, they look at you, they look at the water dish, they look at you. And they're not, just because they don't speak English doesn't mean they aren't speaking all the time. And I want to go back to that Pacific sideband snail because I, I, I know it's just a small thing, but A, that's what a lot of our interactions are, both with humans and the interactions we see with non-humans. They're pretty small things. And it's a pretty, pretty, you know, we we think that that snails don't even, we don't even consider them to have brains, but think about what it did. It realized it couldn't uh, chew through the mantle of the slug, so it has to flip it over, but it has no hands. How is it going to flip it over? So it has to realize, A, I can't get through the back. B, I got to flip it over. C, I can flip it over by getting underneath and then heaving with my shoulders, which is the same thing we would do um, if we didn't have hands or if we're, our hands are busy. I've, I've done that sort of lifting. Many of us have done that sort of lifting all the time. <clears throat> so what am I trying to get at? I'm trying to get at the world is filled with speaking intelligences and now we go back to when I was going to write a language older than words. The first, the first idea I had for it was that I would write about interspecies communication, try to purport to, to try to show that non-humans are able to communicate. And I realized really early on that I couldn't write that book because that's not what's really happening. What's really happening is not can non-humans communicate or can't they? What's really happening is. Why do some of us listen and some of us don't? Why is it that some of us recognize intelligence in non-human species and some of us, the only intelligence we recognize is if it happens to mirror our own? And why is it that some of us have to be dragged kicking and screaming into recognizing that, <clears throat> excuse me, plants communicate 
And I just want to mention Stefano Mancuso's work, which even in the, the, the area of sort of our way of thinking of communication, he's established a dictionary of like 1,200 phrases, chemical phrases that plants will use that mean we're being attacked by caterpillars, we're being, it's dry, it's, you know, messages they send to other other plants or their or themselves. And so even according to a Western scientific perspective, you know, the plants are communicating all the time. And there's an example. There were, there were, <clears throat> there were, I had aphids on some plants that were inside and I couldn't get rid of the aphids. And I took the aphids outside. I took the plants outside. And within a couple hours, there were wasps eating the honeydew exuded from the aphids. And within a day, there are all these itty bitty little parasitoid wasps who lay their eggs inside of aphids. And they had either gotten messages from the plants or they had smelled the aphids, one or the other. And then the place was just a riot of these tiny, tiny little wasps. And so my point in bringing all that up is simply the way you listen to the land is by paying attention. It's no different than paying attention to any of your friends, just any of your other friends, I should say. And another part of this I want to bring up is that this is all really important because John Livingston, he said it really well, that he talked about when, okay, when I used to go on tour a lot, I would uh, get done with my talk and I would go back to my hotel room and shut the shut the curtains and just keep all the lights out because I felt like I had so much sensory overload. I felt like um, I had been just a, my skin had been abraded off with all the sharp corners and the loud noises and and radios and car horns and everything else. And so it feels like a city is a place of sensory uh, overload. But John Livingston talked about how it's really a place of sensory deprivation. And it's not just cities, but everywhere in that. I mean, think about right now where you are and look around and listen around and feel around and you will probably discover that almost all of your sensory perceptions are either created by or mediated by human beings and or their creations like machines. And almost none of them are coming from outside. One of the most horrifying moments of my life was when I realized that I touch plastic more than I touch human flesh. And John Livingston talked about how if you, if all of your sensory perceptions are coming from one source, you, he says, it's like being in a sensory deprivation tank and you can start to hallucinate as you would in a sensory deprivation tank. And you can, he, he believed, and I agree with this, that most of our, uh, common sense and most of our ideologies are based on hallucinations and that sounds really highfalutin but really all it means is that if all we ever do is hear machines and all we ever do is hear humans we come to believe that humans are the only ones who are speaking and we come to believe that humans are the only ones who matter and this manifests in so many different ways i mean one way that manifests pretty obviously that i've made fun of for years is that any time, not, not fun fun, but horrifying fun, is that any time you see an article in the mainstream sources about, say, some species going extinct or some biome being in trouble, it always has to tie it to how that affects the economy. And that's what John Livingston would have called a hallucination. It's this belief that the economy is more important than, than physical reality. So what, what I'm trying to do with all of this is, and I should I should tell you, Max, that I'm winding this down. So if you want me to stop, I'll stop. And if you want me to keep going, have another question ready for me. Um, but what I'm trying to do with everything I've said so far is just demystify listening to the natural world. It's not this huge uh, special project that you have to train for years to do is just recognizing that 
they are beings who are completely different than us, but they still have commonalities like they want to live. They want to, I mean, if they're a social animal, they want to have social relations. Um, and, you know, I've, it also takes time. I remember something Vine Deloria. Sorry, Max, I'm going to go on for a second, of course. Um, but Vine Deloria, when I interviewed him years ago, he, he talked about how his students at the University of Colorado would go off and they would go hiking and they would come back and say, wow, I had this profound nature experience. And he would say, no, you didn't. You had an aesthetic experience that it's like meeting somebody for two hours and hanging out. You have a really nice time, but that's not really a relationship yet. And it's the same with this, that over the last 25 years of living in this place, I have grown to know some of the specific, some of my specific neighbors. I mean, there are specific bears who I have various forms of relationship. There are specific crows. I had a quick crow story that, you know, crows are known for like giving people gifts. And I was feeding the crows for quite a while. And I started to, I don't really have the envy gene, but I started getting envious, especially when this one friend of mine in Los Angeles, he told me about, they gave him a dog tag. And I'm like, my crows never do anything. The crows here haven't given me anything. And the moment, it was so funny, the moment I was thinking, I, I literally thought this, I am in a relationship with the most ungrateful crows in the world. The moment I said that to myself, I turned and they'd left me a pop can on a dead tree. Um, and I mean, it's it's a small thing, but it's those are the moments I think that we live for. Those are the moments that for me, I remember for the rest of my life. And so two things. One is go outside and just hang out. I mean, you can be reading. You don't have to like be meditating. I'm not putting, I shouldn't put a negative phrase, there's a negative tone on meditating. You don't have to, but the point is you don't have to do something fancy. Just go outside, hang out. And um, and then try to be in a relationship with a with a with a piece of land for a long, long time. And over time, it will grow to trust you if you act in a trustworthy fashion. Oh, and the third thing is make the land happy that you're there. How can you help it in a tangible way? And what do we do with human neighbors? You know, somebody new shows up in the neighborhood. And if you want to become friends with them, you go take them a pie. And it's the same with the non-humans. You know, you go say, hi, how you doing? Um, which, frankly, I do a better job with my non-human neighbors than I do with my human neighbors. But we'll leave that aside. Thank you, Derek. So this is my next question for you, which is you've been calling for many years for resistance, including uh, you, you've often called yourself the everything guy. So you've included a, a whole range of resistance tactics in the things and strategies and the things that you call for, including what many would call very radical, like blowing up dams or sabotaging pipelines. You helped write the whole book, Deep Green Resistance, which lays out a case for these more radical tactics, given the um, ongoing ecological collapse that is accelerating and getting worse day by day. Could you speak to why you think this is important and whether you think the situation has changed in the 12 years since the Deep Green Resistance book came out and that strategy was, uh, was, was first sort of put to the public? Well, three parts here. One is I first became an environmentalist really in second grade when they put in a subdivision next to where I was living. And it wasn't, I didn't have this language, but I, I, I did have the language of where will the cottonwoods go? Where will the meadowlarks go? Where will the garter snakes go? Where will the grasshoppers go? The ants go? And the language I didn't have is you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. I figured that out in second grade and I, it's not cognitively challenging. And so let's move forward to I'm in my late 20s, early 30s and a baby activist. And I see all of these activists around me in public. They are talking about how uh, we need to stop this or that timber sale. Um, but they aren't talking about the fact that civilization has been destroying forests for several thousand years. And in private, 
all of these activists are saying that what they're doing is holding on by their fingernails, hoping and praying that this or that being lasts or this or that place lasts until civilization collapses. But none of them said that in public because they knew that if they said that in public, they would lose credibility and they would no longer be able to protect this or that piece of ground. And I thought, well, fine, I'll take the hit. You know, I'll go ahead and say it because somebody's got to say it. Somebody, somebody has to be the first one through the door. And of course, I wasn't the first one through the door because indigenous people have been saying this forever. And you have Mencius saying this in ancient China. You've got, um, let's fast forward a lot. You've got Lewis Mumford saying this all through the 20th century. You've got um, oh God, I can't remember the guy's name, but there was this guy in Florida who was talking about this and saying how it was about 1900, about how much Florida had been destroyed in the previous 100 years. And it doesn't take a cognitive giant to figure out that, to recognize that if, you know, if there are uncountable salmon and then there are countable salmon and then there's 500,000 salmon and then 200,000 salmon, that eventually that goes to zero. It doesn't, it, it, it boggles my mind that people in general don't see this. So I, and another thing that boggles my mind is that people don't understand that the planet is the source of all life and that without a living planet, you don't have anything. You don't have a social system. You don't have capitalism. You don't have, libraries you don't have modern medicine you don't have any of that without a living planet and so this is something that i talked about with um as as we were writing bright green lies i talked about this a lot that all of the so-called solutions to global warming what they haven't put forward by the mainstream what they all have in common is take industrial capitalism as a given and the natural world as having to conform to industrial capitalism and that's literally insane in terms of being out of touch with physical reality that's the inverse of what it should be what it should be is that the natural world is the independent variable and the society is the dependent variable based on it because without a living planet you have no society at all and so again your social system must conform to the requirements of a living planet and of a living land base a living local land base and i don't so i just then took that one step further it's like so endgame was really written because i would ask thousands of people at talks do you this question thousands of people literally thousands do you believe this culture will undergo a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living out of thousands of people none of them ever said yes one guy at one talk raised his hand and then he said, oh, voluntary. No, of course not. And the, the point is that if you, is that we will be living sustainably someday or we won't be living at all, but will that happen voluntarily? I don't, I don't see it. Every cell in my body wants for that to happen, but I don't see it. So the next question is, if you don't believe there's going to be a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living and you care about life on the planet, what does that mean for your strategy and for your tactics? And the answer is we don't know because we don't talk about it. The reason we want to talk about it is because we're all so busy pretending that there'll be this magical transformation that we don't believe is going to happen. So to take a really straightforward example, um, but 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 I had a really interesting conversation with with an Anishinaabeg woman about a very smart Anishinaabeg woman about um, about the role of hope in all of this, hope and prayers, and we both agreed. That if you just hope and pray that salmon survive, then that is really an obscenity, if that's all you do. And we both agreed that what salmon need to survive is for dams to be removed, industrial logging to stop, industrial fishing to stop, the murder of the oceans to stop, and global warming to stop. And we both agreed that if you don't do those, but then merely wish and hope that salmon survive, that's not good enough. But if you do all of those, you stop industrial logging, stop industrial fishing, stop the take out the dams, stop the murder of the oceans, stop the stop global warming. If you do all those, then she said that you have to pray that the that the river accepts your offering, and you have to pray that the salmon accept your offering, and that at that point it's out of you've done what you can, 
and then it's up to them to do the rest. And frankly, if all of those happened, salmon would be totally fine. Um, but you asked how things have changed in the last, in the intervening 14 years or 12 years or however many years. And I had been saying for a long time, for 20 years now, more than 20 years, that I thought if civilization came down by 2025, that salmon would be fine because they're incredibly resilient. And it's 2023 and what, two or three years ago, uh, the Yurok down in Klamath had to uh, really stop their salmon festival or stop eating salmon at the salmon festival because the salmon are getting hammered. And I don't know, I might be wrong on 2025, um, maybe it's 2030. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to put a number on. And I'm also not saying 2030 is the date they go extinct. What I'm saying is that that's when the population is. What I'm really saying is that, yes, things are bad and they're getting worse. Again, every cell in my body wishes that we were using our cleverness to fix problems. If, if we were using our intelligence to fix problems, I probably would have stuck with engineering and science. And, you know, it'd be really fun to try to engineer our way out of this, but we're not. And it's not even engineer. It's just, it would be really fun to lend our weight to the natural world as the natural world does its best to recover. And here's one more thing I want to say, which is that I often talk about the uh, various resistance to the Nazis in World War II, whether it's the German resistance or the Polish resistance or the French resistance or Dutch resistance, Yugoslavian resistance, any of those. I, I talk about them quite often and sometimes and talk about them and bring them up to date, up to the present. And sometimes people will say to me, so gosh, Derek, you know, that's great, but you know that the resistance members didn't actually stop the Nazis. It was the Soviet army and the British and American air forces that really stopped the, the Nazis. And we don't have anybody like that on our side. And that's true. We don't have a big army coming to rescue us, but we do have someone who is desperately trying to stop this culture. And that is wild nature. And wild nature, every moment of every day, is working to take down buildings, is working to take out dams, is working to, I mean, what do you think hurricanes are? What do you think tornadoes are? What do you think rats and mice are? What do you think, this, this, is, this is nature fighting back. And what we need to do is to align ourselves in whatever ways are appropriate and in whatever ways we can best serve, we need to align ourselves with the living planet, which one of the primary ways that I think is important is to protect. There are other ways we can go on the offensive too, but there are other ways that are important, such as protecting wild places and wild beings. And it's like my friend John Osborne always says that as things become increasingly chaotic, he wants to make sure that some doors remain open. And what he means by that is if bull trout are still around in 20 years, they may still be around in the hundred, but they're gone in 20, they're gone forever. And if, this particular piece of forest is still standing in 20 years. It may be here in 100. If it's gone in 20, it's gone forever. And I really believe, and I have for the longest time, that this is an all hands on deck situation. And, and we're talking about life on the planet. And as I've said for a very long time, the people who live 100 years from now are not going to care whether we voted Democrat or Republican. They're not going to care about whether we recycled. They're not going to care about much, except can they breathe the air? Can they drink the water? And will the land support them? Well, Derek, I want to thank you for your words tonight and for all your work. I wouldn't be here without you and without your uh, your work. Specifically, I saw Derek speak in 2009 giving, it wasn't his endgame talk, but it was a basically a Q&A or sort of a spinoff based on his endgame talk. And that 
night changed my life. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm not the only one I know. I'm not the only one who's watching right now who, uh, who has been profoundly influenced by your work. So I really appreciate it. And, uh, thank you again. Well, thanks for saying that. Um, I appreciate it. So, um, we have one more live speaker who's going to be joining us today. I want to remind folks who have perhaps joined the live stream more recently, this event, Ecology of Spirit, is a fundraising event for Deep Green Resistance. We're a small grassroots radical organization. We're willing to say things that most people aren't, most organizations aren't, because there are costs associated with it. And uh, as Will Falk uh, told everyone earlier in this broadcast, him and I are both being fined almost $50,000 by the federal government for building latrines for native elders at the Thacker Pass protest camp. We're being sued along with five other allies of ours and the organization Protect Thacker Pass for fighting to defend the land. Our allies in the Philippines are facing uh, disappearances and state-sponsored violence, one of the most violent places in the world for land defenders. We have seen all across the world an epidemic of repression and backlash towards environmentalists, um, huge amounts of violence, state-sanctioned and vigilante that makes this work very difficult. And then on top of that, we have this very powerful moderating force in the environmental movement where funding gets funneled towards organizations that don't challenge the status quo. So if you're an organization like, uh, like a mainstream nonprofit that is going to promote wind and solar energy or nuclear power as the solution to these issues, these technologies are compatible with capitalism. They're compatible with the ruling class as it currently exists. And that is why billions and billions of dollars are flowing towards these technologies, trillions even. And activist groups that were once protecting the land that were once protecting territory and wild beings, wild places, have now been co-opted into promoting a certain type of industrial technology, certain sectors of the industrial economy, and calling that defense of the land. Because we take a more radical stance, we can't get funding from big foundations, from major donors. So we rely on donations from folks like you. So there is a donation link that is in the chat for this event. It's givebutter.com slash ecology of spirit. There, there are multiple ways to donate there. And there's also an auction if folks are interested in checking out some of the auction items that have been donated along the way. So our last live speaker for today is Alan Clements. And I'm very excited to introduce Alan. We just met pretty recently and I came across his work when I was researching topics like this, Alan uh, is an author, activist, former Buddhist monk, and founder of World Dharma. He's also a leading authority on Burma's nonviolent struggle for freedom and democracy. He's the author of quite a few books, including Instinct for Freedom and The Voice of Hope, which is an internationally acclaimed book of conversations with Burma's Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Aung San Suu Kyi. Alan says things that many people don't say, like the fact that spiritual narcissism is rampant, that religion in our culture by function is often a persona of arrogance, that there is so much carnage on the shoreline of the spiritual realm of, of predation by teachers and gurus and priests and so on. And Alan encourages us not to just live in the present moment, but to actually live for the next seven generations. So I'm very pleased and honored to introduce Alan Clements. Alan, are you with us? I'm with you, Max. Well, thank you for joining us, Alan. And if you want to just take it away, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Okay. Well, I'm touched and honored here in uh, Bali to participate in my humble way in my style, which is just organic, extemporaneous, um, from my heart to yours. And I deeply thank you and the other luminaries, other speakers, specifically Derek, Derek Jensen, 
I too, um, immeasurably moved by his ethical, environmental, I would call it spiritual courage and intelligence, uh, the culture of make-believe, and then of course the language older than words, end game, uh, life-changing. Cannot recommend the importance of not only just reading those books, but studying and researching because they illuminated and changed the course of my life where at a time I thought it was pretty embedded. Now, if I may take the last 15 minutes of this 20 minutes and intersect a few personal stories that both changed my life and opened me to what I would call contextual engagement rather than simply as a former Buddhist monk living in the country of Burma, the study of consciousness in pretty much disembodied from that with the priority of transcendence, enlightenment, personal peace, and almost oblivious, if not a type of ecological, I dare even use this word, a type of ecological dementia with regard to context, especially nature animals, birds, trees, and other humans that I attribute Derek introducing me to through his work, uh, at William Canton, I think it is, with Overshoot in his book, and the introduction to the concept of ghost slaves. Uh, I went to the country of Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, in 1977. I ordained as a Buddhist monk there pretty much to escape the carnivore capitalism of my country of America. I went to the University of Virginia, studied pre-law and psychology, and felt completely at two with what I called the, the empowered war culture. And so this led me to Burma to primarily study human consciousness, not as a Buddhist, but through the power of mindfulness meditation, which has become ubiquitous worldwide since this time. 1980, I'd been in the monastery for nearly a year. I noticed an older man who was coming to the monastery and soon thereafter, he was introduced to me and it happened to be the former, the former general of the army under the dictator that let me into the country. His name was Ne Win, and the former general was named U Tianu. And he and I became very close friends. He ordained as a monk. And he told me that he had just spent the last six years in solitary confinement based upon the fear of the dictator. And he, again, was the general of the army of a coup d'etat. And unbeknownst to him, one day he was taken to prison and there he was left pretty much to rot in solitary confinement. And upon his release, he came to the monastery to pretty much avoid imprisonment again and to study meditation, which a jailer smuggled into his prison cell, a book on the power of mindfulness to overcome deeply embedded inner conflicts, suffering, and stress. And it really helped him survive in solitary confinement. The point being, he introduced me to context. We as monks and nuns in the monastery were being given food, given medicines, given our robes, given a sacred place to meditate in peace. But he informed me, he said, Alan, the entire country of nearly 50 million people live under dictatorial, pathological, deeply embedded, toxic patriarchal dominator metaphors. It's a slave nation where most of everything is being done on a dollar or two a day. Plastics, food, foresting, rubies, water, shellfish, oil, and gas. The entire country has been sold pretty much to China and Russia where they are being supplied carte blanche with weapons and money through a proxy dictator who enslaves his own people 
to allow you, Alan, as a monk to meditate in peace. And it was like, oh, my God. I always knew these things, but I didn't really, the question being, I didn't really feel it. And so it was very hard for me to shake the emerging, I would call it intuitive insights of a context awareness, okay? Jump time, 1988, August. Burma's students led a nationwide nonviolent revolution to confront this pervasive, toxic, patriarchal, capitalistic, dominator, driven dictatorship supported again by international corporations oil and gas weapons china russia big oil in america and europe to dominate the culture the students said enough is enough our suffering is too great to persist under the dictatorial violence the pathological violence of this regime. They nonviolently protested. The dictator had indoctrinated military that had orders to shoot and diplomats on the scene. I was informed up to three to five, up to 10,000 people unarmed were massacred in over a week to two weeks. I read about this in the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN. Many of my family, I thought, were doomed, had been killed and shot. I went into the country underground shortly thereafter, primarily not as an activist, but to see my family. From that serendipity of just trusting my instinct, and I can't say enough about trusting one's instinct to follow the adventure of caring, Okay, I'll get into that, which is another way of looking at activism for me, the instinct for caring. So I went into the country and again, I met with my friends, Utinu. He introduced me shortly thereafter to this woman. As Max introduced her, I did a book of conversations with her in 1995 called The Voice of Hope. She had won the Nobel Peace Prize under house arrest. He introduced me to her. Now, mind you, all of the leaders of this revolution in 88 up to 95, were students and other people. They were all imprisoned. Many of them raped and tortured, lost their home, their bank accounts. They lost everything except their dignity and their conscience. And I was invited to do a book of conversations with her if I could meet her. And I met with her. And the first question I asked her, which is halfway through this 20 minute presentation, which has said, Aung San Suu Kyi, you're known worldwide for a divinely inspired revolutionary, a woman who's leading a nonviolent Gandhi inspired, Martin Luther King inspired, Buddhist oriented revolution of the spirit, you call it. What is the essence of this spirit? What is the essence of this revolution? And she said, Alan, you were out on the street. Nearly a thousand people came out to listen to us talk about the wisdom of revolution. Every one of them had to leave their home, the safety of their closets, their four walls, and risk defying state dictatorial orders of five or more guaranteed imprisonment, loss of home, bank account, and often being tortured if not raped. That took courage, Alan, obviously. They had to come out of their fear and risk everything to stand and listen in nonviolent solidarity. You ask for the essence of our revolution of the spirit? Courage. She said, the courage to care, I'll never forget this, the courage to care for things larger than your own self-interest. That is the living essence of conscience and hope and dignity in dynamic action. And I went, oh my God, that's so rad. She said, however, we don't encourage people to overcome their fear, but we learned from our mutual teacher, the late Venerable Seda Upandita. He introduced me to the concept of learning to psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually quiver. Quiver at the confluence of where fear meets freedom 
to care for things larger than your own self-interest. And I went, how cool is that? Learning to, okay, care about things larger than your own self-interest. She said to me, in a nutshell, we must look at the truth of a circumstance, a circumstance, uh, a circumstance clearly. Then we must feel into that contextual wisdom. Is my lifestyle, is my thoughts, is the way in which I acquire my livelihood, my food, my fellow brothers and sisters, are they well off based upon my lifestyle? No, they're oppressed. Courage to care to consider the life of others. They came out. We must look for the truth. We must feel the truth. And it's not enough just to feel the truth, she said. We must learn to act. The last third of this talk, it never left my mind, this look, see, know, feel, discern, and learning to act, the courage to care for things larger than your own self-interest. Now, easy theoretically to feel this or to see this, but shortly thereafter on Independence Day, I'll never forget this, January 4th, 1996, 400 of the country's leading nonviolent activists came to her compound. All of them risked long-term imprisonment. But they said, enough is enough. We're going to rally. They had celebrations of theater, of poetry. Obviously, many of you know that George Orwell lived in Burma. The seeds of 1984 are deeply embedded in the psychology of the revolutionaries in Burma. England, based upon Winston Churchill's father in 1821 or so, decided to pluck Burma, the ruby of the Orient, and give it to the UK queen. 125 years of white imperialistic dominator behavior in Burma. People forget that Burma convulsing under dictatorship was dominated by a genocidal repressive patriarchal white dominator metaphor, setting that aside. At the end of the day, they had Burma's leading satirist and part of the revolution in Burma is using your voice, using the power of conscience and dignity in dynamic auditory vibrational revolution. We don't fight with our fist. We fight with our mind and our voice and our bodies. And I went, how rad is that? And so I had a long history in Burma of comedy and satire as activism. At the end of the day, I was introduced to this man by my translator. He was Uparle. He took to the stage in the microphone with 400 activists and everyone was awed. And they said that Uparle was saying for six years he had been imprisoned, pounding rocks with leg irons and arm irons for the last one hour gig that he gave six years before. He said to the audience, I'll never forget this, we have it on film. For six years, I've been waiting for this moment to speak again. Pounding rocks with arm irons and leg irons. And two days before he was released from imprisonment, and this was his first act upon freedom is to come to Aung San Suu Kyi's house and to use his voice to speak, to elevate the courage to care about things larger than your own sound interest. Now pause. Many people associate the spiritual life and its intersection with caring, environmentalism, human rights, environmental rights, with being present. For six years, he waited for a moment in the future where he could use his voice. And it brought up the very thing that I read in Nelson Mandela's book, A Long Walk to Freedom. He said, for 27 long years, it wasn't a day that I did not think of freedom for my people and my own freedom. So the pathology of being paralyzed by the now, as Max said, the American Indians, Indians around the world, they thought of at least seven generations into the future, the courage to care about life not yet born. And so he satirized Big Brother for those one hours. And he said to the audience, I know that what I'm about to say will land me back in prison. And he said, so be it. 
Freedom is more important than fear. As a result of this gig, two days later, Upar Leg was imprisoned by the running dogs of the dictatorship for another six years, pounding rocks and in leg irons and arm irons. And I met him upon his release. And he told me, as I asked him, how did you survive imprisonment at that level? He said, Alan, I never saw that my freedom was theirs to take, despite the iron bars and the chains on my hands. They were not elements of incarceration. Nobody, he said, can control your mind or your freedom or your conscience and your dignity unless you allow them. And he uttered Da Aung San Suu Kyi's words. We must learn the spiritual activist motto, the courage to care for things larger than one's own self-interest. I'll end here. For 10 years with my colleague Fergus Harlow, we interviewed nearly 250 former political prisoners in Burma, four volumes set called Burma's Voices of Freedom, long form interviews. How did you manage to live in prison and maintain your dignity and conscience? Again, most of them uttered that our belief systems and our freedom were so interconnected with context, with society, with the future of life not yet born, that that caring far exceeded our privilege to live outside of prison, in our home, in our money, in our wealth. And it empowered me to believe in the elegance, the power, the passion of compassion imbued conscience to live in the vocation of an extended life that cares for the future of life rather than the privilege of our own unrecognized profit, power, patriarchy, and the collusion with what Derek knows so well in his work, which I've studied also, the pathology of violence. I've studied the psychology of genocide. My first book was Burma, the Next Killing Fields, is the unrecognized collusion with violence with weaponry, with the denigration of the future. My last book, Extinction X-Rated, if I had 24 hours to speak, what would I say to the world if I was wired to preserve the environment, to preserve the future? And I ask everyone as I close today, I'm in honor of those people, Max and his colleagues, Derek, other people, the illustrious panel today, so many other voices unrecognized, willing to engage this nearly invisible mechanism called toxic, capitalistic driven, pathological, patriarchal, killing off of the animals, the, ple the, the, the oceans, the insects, the birds, the future of life for the blindness of profit, privilege, money, security, and the arrogance of that. Let us be, as Martin Luther King encouraged, radical, sacred rage as a virtue of our wisdom. And to do things against the comfort paradigm of collusion with profit and security. And I can't say enough, trust your own instinct for freedom, your own instinct for caring. And I'll end here. I do believe in nonviolence as the priority, but how many of my friends in Burma right now, Da Aung San Suu Kyi in solitary confinement, a global witch hunt against her, driven by the lies of the New York Times, BBC, the CNN, vilified her. So many people in that country are friends of mine. They're revolutionaries. We'd rather fight back than be murdered in our homes, in our schools, in our monasteries. How many people I've seen the virtue of the need to not just stand at the front lines, but that radical option, if needed, to fight back in defense of the reality of our coexistence for the love of the future of freedom and the love of the planet that will exceed the human species 
if enough of us care about the future of freedom and the courage to care about things larger than our own self-interest. Trust that instinct as Uparle showed me and all these people in Burma and around the world and Max and others. Risk it. The virtue of risking it for the preservation, the sustainability of a future to believe in. And so from my heart to yours, I hope there's something in this that might touch you. Aha. Uh -huh. What are some of the ways that I can implement courageously in my own little way the art of poetry, the art of theater, the art of writing, the art of interrelationship? And as Aung San Suu Kyi said, one person at a time, if we do that, our revolution will be successful. So from my heart to yours, thank you for tuning in and thank you for allowing me to speak at this extraordinarily important deep green resistance, global event. Alan, thank you very much. It's a it's a pleasure and an honor to have you with us. And I know I'm speaking for everyone watching when I say that your words were incredibly moving. I was just finding myself in tears a minute ago listening to you because it comes from the heart. And, um, you know, that's something that I said earlier in this event. I know it's very early in the morning for you, so I appreciate you getting up and joining us. But it's something that I said earlier is that you see this thread throughout history, throughout different types of movements addressing different issues around justice, ecology, all of these different things. You see this reverence for uh, a sense of the divine, the sacred, the transcendent, but so often it is a, a, a sense of reverence for basic dignity, basic principles of justice, fairness, equality. Um, the future, the value of the future. And that is what leads people to to take risks, to find that courage. And you said it far more beautifully than I could. So um, thank you so much. Really appreciate you being here. It's an honor to be here, Max. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone else. Okay, everybody, our last speaker for the day. We're going to wrap up after this with a quick poem from Will Falk. But our last speaker for the day is Teokasin Ghost Horse. Um, Teokasin is a broadcaster. He is a member of the Cheyenne River Lakota Nation of South Dakota and has a long history with indigenous advocacy. He's the founder, host, and producer of First Voices Radio, which has been on the air since 1992. Uh, he's also a musician, and uh, he received a nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2016. So I'm going to share the video that Teokasin and I recorded a few days ago, and then we will hear from Will Falk. So here's Teokasin. Spirituality is where we all come from. I should explain it in a, in a way that I understand it from the older ones that I have grown up with and I carry their messages in my DNA and that's the messages of earth. And if I could say that's the core of my spirituality, then yes, that it is. That's the earth. It, there's no connection. There's no tie. There's no bond because if we are becoming earth as we are being born, we are becoming earth as we are living. We are becoming earth as we are dying because it's true. We're, we're in that cycle of spirituality and that has nothing to do with religious aspects our modern democratic age has manufactured a personal spirituality to meet everyone's needs which is absolutely guaranteed to be calm sweet peaceful a light positive comfortable reassuring and unthreatening and instead of leaving the sacred well alone which would have been the wisest thing to do we domesticated it no less effectively than we managed to domesticate everything else trivialized and thoroughly pretty fine it agreed on making it into something politically correct so that's the the gist of what we have done with spirituality today is that we put it into a religious context and this is where i think maybe before your time maybe not is that when 1978 when we were given so-called freedom of religion here in the united states as native people that's when we considered that oh they have a religion which is not true because if you read the definitions of religion it's not the same with spirituality and spirituality 
spirituality is something that um, has been redefined by those who have rejected religion and dogma, and they turned it into new ageisms. In that part, I can say that when we or point when we point ourselves back to the true origin, our spiritual source, which is Earth, then we make property out of that somehow. In the West, the Western mind makes it property, and therefore Native people can't invoke spirituality because they are that land that's being gouged and mined and taken away and made into property and ownership. And so that spiritual source is, is sort of gutted, it's sort of distracted, it's sort of dispelled and, you know, redirected to into a religion. And that religion has to do with the rules and regulations of how spiritual you can be. And therefore it's, it's being objectified. And so we make spirituality into an object, what it can be like politically or, you know, even religiously. And I'm thinking that my involvement as, as a Native person from where I'm from, and I can only speak as one um, and not speak for the whole of Lakota, is that the bottom line is meaning knowing the power that is peace is actually earth and if you have that it's not outside of yourself it's not just in yourself and you don't have power over anything that you are all of that anyway and we put up connotations of borders and divisive words and conflicting words is that we begin to doubt who's spiritual and not spiritual and we dole out who is and who is not and therefore it's religion american indian religious freedom act in 1978 said oh we we could we could pray again we could speak our language we could sing and we could dance again but by the time we receive that again almost a hundred years i'm thinking how many generations have been separated from that and we've kind of went into the dogma of saying he is a creator or she is a goddess and we've only compounded the problem and we have to unweave that somehow break out of that shell that it's okay to be who we are as native people and speak with the bigger message of earth and that bigger message of earth is, of course is saying protect me and because if i'm not protected i can't give life and so that spirituality is actually protecting the rights of, of earth um, because she gave us the rights of nature she gave that us the right to live here we didn't give her we don't give her mother earth rights we we just protect and how she she gives us every day she gives us everything where all our needs are met every day and we don't recognize that then there is no spirituality the old way that's relegating us to a traditional um, timepiece like an anthropology or a history museum it's the current way and more than just native people are seeing this current way, but there is a lack of recognition of the language we are using because I, I say that, yeah, we want to be centered on earth. We want to make sure that we are protecting the land and all that. And we know species and, you know, but we put it in a measured value. And that often comes out in into something we can explain back into the box, why we must protect it. We have to be careful of the type of language we use and not infer that, that we all got to get along just to get along. And that's just a human value because that's anthropocentric thinking. Now, if we take that away, what is there? There is a nature. Nature comes first. If it's ordered, then that's what it is. It's an order. Nature comes first. It it's, makes sense because we are that. We are becoming nature all the time. Earth, all life is an acknowledgement or acknowledging relationship. That's beyond just a human. So spirituality, people think is a human thing. Spirituality, religion is a human thing, is, is what it is. And I don't think life, plants, and animals have religion. They do understand spirituality because that has to do with intuition. Everything from the government to science to uh, religion is not being de delivering. It's not It's not deep enough. It's We don't get visceral feelings out of shallowness. We get emotional. And so that can be controlled by the manipulations of government, science, and religion. If there are 4,000 organized religions in the world, there's own one spirituality that's earth and tokahe makaina who comes first we always in our language of lakota say things like that but i do we must always think of earth first because it's in our language it's at the center to me is the greatest mystery by which all is seen and through which we see a mystery and so it's always a conundrum in religion the spirituality you don't try to solve it but religions are all trying to solve governments are trying to solve science is trying to solve a mystery and that's one why they are driven insane because you cannot own property that if that makes any sense so you cannot own spirit you cannot own and then 
people are killing each other trying to own the spirit by thinking that land is property that they can own spirit out of and you see that all across this planet western hemisphere is land and we must that's where the indians live and that's spiritual but it's not the indians making that land spiritual it's a land making the indians spiritual the last few decades you know this is fire mining is fire um taking water is fire you know this is the, the mentality behind this is um <clears throat> and it's all across the continents the rise of forest fire earth is heating up um and you know we don't think about tossing a bottle no consequential thinking here you know how we are affecting the earth and we are we are unaware how trivial we make those dangers and how insignificance where there is simply no thought humans tend to think well we we lay it waste have a barren surface we can put civilization there and forget about the plants and the birds and the animals that lived there for eons before humans ever showed up and indigenous peoples we forget about indigenous peoples that we have experienced the same thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of living with fire living with water living with earth living with wind and that the way to live is that we ensure all the lives matter Matter, that all relations matter and not just to anthropocentric human but i want to sing a song about how we forgot about our impact on earth and it really has to do with rational justifications and making our world our civilization better by ignoring natural balance and we continue sort of narcissistically with these ideas that we because we are as humans don't understand that we've caused the tragedies, tragedies that we lament in song. So there's a lot of lamenting going on both sides. I think when oppression, sadness, all of these things are happening on us, to us, we tend to think that's who we are. But then the things that come from other indigenous peoples really help me to understand that sadness is upon us, oppression is on us. So where's our, our language about taking that off? Because we aren't born this way. We weren't born with sadness. We want to be in that tragedy of the language uses that this is who we are, we're possessed. It's hard to get out of that mentality. So we weren't born this way. We, we weren't born sad or, or happy or anything. We were just born. And from that, we don't understand that we need to struggle in, with learning how to breathe, within learning how to walk, learning how to, we need to do all these things. And we were taken away from our struggles and we're put into a civilization. So we don't struggle, we don't suffer. And that's separation. So to me, it's easily like pay attention to language. The biggest separation tragedy trauma is our separation from earth no one talks about that we talk about the ptsd that humans have caused to humans and you know natural disasters but is that a disaster to earth when she's trying to keep balance we just are out of rhythm with earth that we don't know what balance is anymore we only value what how each other we exchange with each other as humans so the description of our separation of earth is the biggest trauma we don't know how to live with the earth anymore and this is how how we're going to do that we're going to rely on technology and religion and the government's going to take care of us so we line up and we queue up for it and there's no individual thinking there's no there's no autonomy with spirit and spirituality is is a personal thing that has to do with all things so we, we get down to a material view and we we tend to change definitions understanding our struggle instead of trying to build build a bridge so that we don't struggle it's understanding the struggles is not suffering it's like looking left looking right i'm not a leader i'm not a follower i'm walking with others in struggle and that means walking with earth so where's my reference point going to be it's going to be with the experience because the baby language we speak now is codified and won't allow people but only a privilege to speak that language and those so-called uneducated ones you know that barely can write maybe don't want a computer we have to think about the imperialist implications that we even you you and i have about applying this is how those people uneducated people think when it's not true because we don't have the experience with them so experience intuition is how to do but it doesn't have an agenda we have to listen to understand not just listen to reply
we live in a time and place where our spirits can be eaten. So what's eating that spirit is religion, is government, is language. You're born into a, a place that you see this is how we become, this is how we become a Wendigo, this is how we become a Shichu, and that's normal now. If you lose relationship, then you learn how to speak a disconnecting language. You have to realize we didn't go anywhere as Native people. Native people, we stayed home. Everybody else has moved. Everybody that came here it came away from their their coal, their core, the land of where their people are from. But we're deciding these peoples who are in charge here are deciding war decisions. They're deciding to sign that document to say, yes, mine that, that land. Yes, go over to the current situation in the Middle East. Yes, do these things. Here's some money. So they're making decisions and they're not even at home. I say, how dare these folks make decisions about somebody else's home? There is moral corruption, religious corruption, but underneath, even in those folks, there is a spirituality that they don't recognize. So recognizing that is something that I can say there is a human to human language. Then there's a human to think that he can talk to nature. But then there is the ceremonies that I've been in where nature and these spirits talk to you. And that's the language we don't understand. It takes a lifetime to understand that. And the people are in a hurry to own that, to grab it, because they feel like they're, it's the time of the biblical ark. The ark is, is almost ready and people want to get on board. They're, they're speaking in survivalist languages. There's language of fear of war, being killed, tortured, our property being taken away. And so the long timeline of wars and the fearfulness of people escaping that prison coming to the west and we as native people watching the ships coming we have the view from the shore and how much of us natives here have lost that view from the shore and accepted the oppression and everything else we give we give we give now there's nothing else that we can give as native people it's a better world there's, there's heaven out there but it's, a, it's certainly not earth when you're protecting the earth that's the best road any human can be because in protecting earth you learn how to live with the earth, which is our ultimate challenge as humans. When we're born to becoming earth, becoming earth when we're dying. So it's all a movement. And so the greatest challenge again, another one is we don't understand the war against earth that even ourselves are committing by continually extracting. So it's extractive mindsets. And we rationalize that because we don't have it's essential. We we think about the language of I, me, my, mine, and ours. You think about how earth is having her difficulties with us as as misbehaved children. And while the, all the other animals and birds and plants are not misbehaving, they're still carrying out the language from the beginning. That was Teokasin Ghost Horse. I want to thank everyone for all their support during this event, all of our incredible speakers, everyone who's contributing behind the scenes to help make this event happen, all the supporters who are donating everyone who is watching and sharing and spreading the word, the folks who can't afford to donate but are still helping this movement, this community, this organization, this, uh, this transformation in whatever ways they can. Um, if folks didn't have a chance to do it so far, you, you'll be able to donate at givebutter.com slash ecology of spirit for as long as it takes for us to meet our goal. We're especially looking once again for monthly recurring donors who can help us have that sustained source of funding to allow us to plan ahead for the future and you know count on some support at the time that we're going to need it. But um, uh, thank you again for all the all the support that folks are offering. And I'm pretty tired, as you can probably tell. It's been a long event. We're an hour past our scheduled closing time. But that's what happens when you have wonderful speakers. We didn't even have a chance to hear today from Suprabha Session, um, an incredible woman and, and somebody who I'm honored to call a friend who uh, was unable to join us today. Uh, we had some poetry from Trinity Le Fay lined up that we're not going to be able to squeeze in today, but we're going to kick that to the next fundraiser. Um, but we do have Will, who's joining us uh, live, who is going to share one final poem, and we're going to close with that. Will? Thanks, Max. This poem is called Witch Hunters. Earth, mother of all gods and goddesses, knows that just because magic exists, it does not mean magic is infinite, omnipotent, or even independent 
from the laws of physical existence. She thought every one of her daughters burning at the stake, shrieking for her help, proved this beyond the shadow of a hope as a global inferno scorched those shadows away. She thought the hurricanes she flung at urban coastal cancers, the earthquakes she conjured to shake her children awake, the squirrel and shark saboteurs she recruited to wage war on energy infrastructure were obvious indictments of blind faith in the false idols encouraging us to believe that even if we don't make it, the earth will. Time and time again, with each forest lost, each river dammed, each mountain toppled, she has been defeated by the black sorcery of technologic necromancy. Indeed, how could any animal whose lungs she never fails to fill with the constancy of abundant oxygen whose heart beats in rhythm with her ballads, whose tongue tastes the sweet waters representing her four billion year devotion to giving everyone life, conclude anything other than that she has always remained completely faithful to her commitment. No, the earth, the original witch, does not stand idly by while whole species of her descendants are cast into the abyss of oblivion. She would save her daughters if she wasn't already choking on the stench of her own burning flesh. If her bloody wrists weren't already shackled to a hacked down tree, they had to murder to incinerate her. She would if she could, and she can, if only we became brave enough to stand up to the witch hunters. Thanks.